Thank you very much, Victor, and welcome everyone for the our event, the World Banana Forum and TR4 Global Network Webinar and TR4 Resistant Banana Varieties, Introduction, Development and Evaluation. As you know, this event is a continuation of the two days webinar that we have in January, where we discuss the development of TR4 resistant banana varieties. So this event will be focused on different aspects, but also important when introducing, evaluating and planting uh, resistant banana varieties and foreign germplasm. So I would like to remind you to turn off your microphone when you are not speaking. I would also like to remind you that interpretation is available in the lower tab. You can select, we have English to Spanish. Also, I would like to thank you the uh, regional office of Latin America, the FAO sub-regional office for Mesoamerica for providing support with the interpretation. It is very much appreciated. Thank you, Raisha and Ster. The meeting is being recorded and the recordings will be available in the website of the TR4 Global Network, also the reports. And I would like to remind you to uh, raise your hand so we can give you the word and to ask your questions in the Q&A tab. Also, you can see the Q&A or in the chat box that the panelists will then reply during the questions and answers session. With that, I would like to pass the floor to provide the opening remarks to Mr. Victor Prada, that is the General Secretary of the World Banana Forum Secretariat. Victor, please, you have the screen. Yes, thank you, Mateus. And, uh, and thank you very much for yeah, the, the accuracy. Let's go straight to business because today we have a very interesting webinar ahead. Um, so again, welcome to this third webinar on of the dia for global network um, which will co which will cover as mateus mentioned important thematic areas such as varieties again the continuation of the webinar mentioned before by mateus and protocols for movement of germplast and evaluation of varieties then the world banana forum as you all know is a permanent platform of assembly uh, where the main stakeholders of the global banana supply chain work together to achieve consensus on best practices for sustainable production especially, this is the case on TIA4, and trade. As you all know, the World Banana Forum is represented by all the constituencies of the industry, meaning it brings together uh, governments, retailers, uh, importers, producers, exporters, consumer associations, trade unions, civil society, research institutions, uh, etc. So, as you all know, the World Banana Forum operates with three main uh, working groups according to the three pillars of sustainability. Working Group 1 deals with uh, production, Working Group 2, economic sustainability, Working Group 3, social sustainability. And all of them have their own task forces, um, such as the one on TR4. Back in 2013, uh, after the outbreak in Africa, in Mozambique, we created the TR4 task force with World Banana Forum members. We've been working uh, with the task force since. And then uh, before the outbreak in Colombia, um, we decided that it was, it was necessary to support the coordination and communication of different entities uh, on, on how to tackle, how to work together against the spread of the fungus, the spread of the disease. And that's why in 2020, finally, we launched the TR4 Global Network on TR4. Uh, acknowledging what I've mentioned, the need to, invar to invite far-reaching support from all interested parties in the process of, you know, uh, tackling this uh, situation, this fungus. So the TIA for Global Network is now the, a leading platform for exchange and collaboration that plays the role of a coordination and knowledge hub for awareness and prevention on the spread of the fungus, and it supports project proposals as the one we did for the international context that can be customized for regional or national contests. We also um, have different activities. We enable partnerships between different actors under the FAO umbrella as a neutral convener. We develop and disseminate uh, tools, information, capacity development materials, and other resources that may contribute to generating awareness and knowledge to contain the fungus. So the initiative is essential due to the vital importance of banana production to food security, as you know, and poverty reduction. 
Webana Forum was created because bananas are produced in more than 135 countries. It's a staple crop for many countries, and it's a, a source of food security for more than 400 million people. Of course, as well as an important source of income for many developing countries or emerging nations. So, um, as I mentioned, what the TIA for Global Network is, we are pleased to inform you that we have more than 3,000 stakeholders directly working against TIA4, meaning it's, we are um, materializing what is supposed to be our mandate to, to, to have this uh, capacity to, to communicate and, and share information. And you will know that TIA4 is a, a, a concern that is impossible to eliminate, um, and, and it's um, and it's very expensive. We've been working on different project proposals. Uh, controlling the spread of the disease is expensive. That's why also our platform, as we deal not only with uh, on aspects on production, we also work on economic aspects such as cost of production. We manage to enable coordination between different working groups, working group two on economic, on economic sustainability with working group one, because we also need to understand how much it is and how we can convince other retailers, sorry, other actors, such as retailers. Uh, we need to inform them that, you know, cost of production increase because we are supposed to tackle the spread of the disease. Therefore, that's supposed to be translated into better prices for producers. Those are the type of discussions that we can facilitate or enable in the World Bank Forum umbrella. So um, I think I've allocated already uh, Four minutes, five minutes to this uh, welcome. Again, thank you very much for your participation. Welcome again to this uh, new session of the TIA for Global Network. And uh, with that, I'd like to pass the floor, pass the screen to my colleague, um, Mateus, to read the agenda, and then I will continue with the moderation. Mateus, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, as you see, we have a distinguished panel of panelists today. We will start with the presentation of Mr. Mrs. Shoba Sivanskar from the International Atomic Energy Agency. She will present the current efforts at the joint FAO IEAI Center for Combating Fusarium Wheel TR4. Then we're going to have a presentation from Dr. Wee Guanjun from the Guangdong Academy of Agricultural Sciences, where he will present the research advancements on the developments of TR4 and long shelf life banana varieties. Then we will have a presentation from Embrapa, Dr. Edson Amorim will present the development and evaluation of banana varieties with resistance to fusarium wilt. After that, we will have a question and answer session where you can, uh, type your answers to the panelists. After that, we will have a presentation from Mrs. Raisha Lauger about the FAO support to Latin American countries on the prevention contingency of FOC TR4, following by a presentation of the International Plant Protection Convention. Mrs. Sara Brunel and Mr. Camilo Beltran will present the IPPC guidelines on TR4 prevention and preparedness. Following by a presentation of Mrs. Nancy Villegas from OIRSA about the reference protocol of OIRSA for the safe introduction of Musacea germplasm. And after that, we're going to have a presentation from Mrs. Monica Betancourt on the safe introduction of TR4 resistant materials in Colombia. The last session uh, after that will be from Australian researchers and workers, we're gonna have a presentation from Jeff Daniels from the Queensland Department of Agriculture on resistance banana trials in Australia, followed by a presentation of Dr. Shaur Mintoff on the field screening for resistance of FOC TR4. So with that, I would like to give the floor back to you, Victor, and you have the screen, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Mateus. As, uh, as he mentioned, we are pleased today to have with us uh, Dr. Shoba Shivan Sankar. Uh, she has over 25 years experience in the fields of international agricultural development and sheet biotechnology industry. She managed over 100 published patents and she is the head of plant breeding and genetics of the joint FAO International 
um, Atomic Energy Agency uh, and the Center of Nuclear Techniques in Food and Agriculture of the United Nations. You know, this is a joint venture of, of both institutions and, and she will present today the scientific efforts um, of the Joint Center in fighting Fusarium with Tropical Race 4. So I am pleased to pass the floor to Shoba. Shoba, you have the screen, thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. And thank you, Victor, the World Banana Forum, Matthews. Um, for the invitation to present at today's session. Um, so as Victor introduced, um, I am part of the joint FAO IAEA Center, which is in Vienna, Austria. And we have a facility um, in Vienna as well as a laboratory facility just outside of Vienna in Cyberstoff. Today, I will talk about our work within the plant breeding and genetics subprogram that I lead within the joint FAO IAEA Center. And I'll be speaking about the efforts to combat banana fusarium built um, at the center. Next slide, please. So uh, the work that we do at plant breeding and genetics um, at the joint FAO IAEA Center is demand driven research innovations and applications to develop improved climate change adapted crop, crop varieties for food and nutrition security and for reduced poverty using nuclear and related biotechnologies. The technologies that we use are induced genetic variation using physical radiation or other means, um, chemical radiation, chemical. Um, mutagenesis as well, uh, genomics and genetics, precision phenotyping and selection for all the traits that um, member states demand of us, speed breeding technologies such as doubled haploidy, um, marker assisted breeding, and then we also support seed systems for farmers access to new varieties. We deliver our work through coordinated research projects, which are actually fundamental research R&D projects that uh, um, happen across a coordinated group from um, various um, advanced research institutions across the globe. And part of the research is uh, implemented in our own laboratory outside Vienna. And then the other type of projects is technical cooperation projects, which is actually application of the technology to the field and which involves tremendous amount of capacity building. Next slide, please. Um, I won't go in detail through this, but um, the different steps in developing a variety is presented here. So we use different types of mutagen sources on the first panel, gamma ray electron beam, um, and now we are also testing um, or at least studying feasibility of irradiating using cosmic rays um, in the International Space Station uh, through NASA. And then um, uh, the plant species that we address are wide, food, feed and cash crops, which can be seed propagated and vegetative crops. And uh, this is based upon demand from the member state as to what crop is of the highest priority to them at any particular time point and also what trait is important to them. And then the second panel shows the different types of precision phenome mix and selection technologies that we help them with. And then on the third panel, we use functional genomics and speed breeding, including um, establishing genetic associations, molecular markers, use of candidate genes and developing tools for gene editing basically for functional validation of mutations. And on the last panel is farmer adoption. And we also have a mutant variety database that secures um, voluntarily contributed records from member states. Next slide, please. Um, this database at present holds more than 3,400 um, voluntarily contributed records of mutant varieties released across 72 countries and 238 species, the majority of which are from Asia, followed by Europe and then North America and Africa and Latin America are just coming along. And these varieties are cultivated widely in, uh, mostly in, uh, in 
Asia Pacific and in other regions as well. But the systems, the seed systems are not as um, rigorous in some of the places which we are trying to support. Next slide, please. Uh, a few recent success stories, just to present the type of work that we do. On the top is the boosting of tea plant diversity using single cell uh, regeneration and mutagenesis, the technology that we are just trying to develop at this point. We have had success with the development of mutant varieties of mutant lines of ginger resistant to soft rot. And then another recent success is cotton, heat tolerant cotton varieties released in Pakistan. And these cover more than 40% of the to total cotton grown in the country. Next slide, please. Now talking about a fusarium built in banana, we have had um, a long history of uh, uh, researching on banana, tissue culture of banana, and also using mutation breeding, induced genetic variation to facilitate selection for a wide variety of traits. Most recently in 2017, we started a fundamental research project to be addressing two different traits. One is coffee rust and the other one was banana fusarium belt. And I'll talk more about those, um, uh, the results from the projects. And at the same time, when um, most recently in, uh, uh, in Peru, the disease was reported in 2021, April, we were approached by uh, the Andean community, the secretary of the An Andean community, um, the minister, the foreign minister from um, Ecuador presented a request to the DG of IAEA to provide emergency support to address TR4. And within a month, we were developing a project and um, implementing activities to be addressing, to be identifying immediate needs and um, addressing the immediate request from member states of the Andean community. And then the project grew bigger. Um, this is the INT5158 project, which now uh, includes 13 countries. And this just started in 2022. So, Alongside of that, there are some national. So the project INT5158 is conceived as an interregional project, but right now focusing in Latin America. And um, as it starts, and it's for a five-year duration. Uh, there are two national projects that started this year as well, one in Ecuador and one in Venezuela. And then there is a new CRP that is planned to be launched next year which is in preparation this year. And this is again, a fundamental R&D project that is looking at genetic variation. Um, for the first time, we are looking at um, tier, tier four in a broad perspective um, from within the context of the joint FAO IAEA centers research. And we are looking into providing capacity building and also conducting research on early detection, development of new resistant varieties and on integrated management of the disease. Next slide, please. Um, just to give a very brief intro to um, induced genetic variation, uh, this is the same as in seed crops, but just a little bit different in the sense that we use um, explants and uh, tissue culture. Uh, first, we multiply them in large quantities and then induce uh, mutations and then uh, regenerate. Um, multiple rounds and then start screening for any trait of interest. And this, in this case, it is um, um, resistance to TR4. And um, our efforts have um, identified um, mutant lines with disease resistance within our laboratory outside Vienna and also within the coordinated research project that started earlier. Next slide, please. And this is just a brief example, um, brief uh, pictures to show the tissue culture micropropagation that is happening in the lab. And then the radio sensitivity that we apply to um, the tissue culture material to identify the most optimal dose that does not cause two um, uh, deleterious agronomic effects. And that still allows us to screen for um, traits of importance. And we use the most optimal dose and then go for selection of the trait of importance. And for that, we develop the screen process in-house and these screens are adapted 
adopted or developed in-house. And usually the fundamental research that we do in uh, coordinated research projects together with advanced research uh, institutes across the globe allow us to develop many of these techniques that we, that we then make available to member states through protocol books. Um, next slide, please. And um, so this on the left side panel picture is a screening for resistance under controlled greenhouse conditions. That is a picture from the laboratory. And then on the right side is a picture that um, the present leader of the coordinated research project took when they were having the last project coordination meeting in uh, Guangdong um, Agriculture, uh, Academy of Agricultural Sciences together with Professor Ganju Ying, who was part of that CR and it shows the field grown material that were developed from um, cell culture material uh, mutagenized with EMS. And I'm um, looking forward to hear more from Professor Yi and um, later during this um, session. Next slide, please. Um, currently, we also have um, a, a separate project that I did not mention. This is through um, a, a project that is funded by the Belgium government, and we are looking at, um, we are supporting a PhD programs in Tanzania and Uganda together with um, scientists there, including Altus Wilhoen, who you would know. And um, here we are looking for um, uh, looking to identify mutants of the Machari variety and also uh, looking at the genetic information that is underlying any level of resistance that we um, see in mutant lines. And so this is just a representation of earlier work. The current work is really um, identified more mutant lines and we are looking at the genetic basis of the mutation, the molecular basis of the mutation currently. Next slide, please. Um, on the capacity building front, we do a lot of courses um, through the technical cooperation projects that I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, I talked about two different mechanisms, the fundamental research mechanism, which is the coordinated research project, which is what we were just uh, talking about in the previous two slides. And now we're talking about the technical cooperation project with capacity building and both human capacity building and infrastructure capacity. And this is an example of a recent course um, that was offered this year in February to be looking at tissue culture, uh, mutation induction, and most importantly, to be looking at disease resistance screening at the Cyberstoff Laboratory outside Vienna, the Plant Breeding and Genetics Laboratory in the Joint Center. And uh, the course was offered by us together with, um, um, uh, with um, Miguel Ditta, who you, you all would know, and also um, several members, uh, several colleagues from the Latin American community. The course is, um, is to be followed soon with a course on disease detection and we are still finalizing the details of that and uh, other capacity building in terms of procurements and um, um, scientific visits, et cetera, are um, in the works for this year. It, this um, interregional project that I mentioned uh, earlier on um, in, that started in January 2022, but got into design last August is now really gaining momentum and, um, and is being implemented at a very fast pace. Next, next slide, please. So the capacity building, as I mentioned just now, um, we are looking for procurement through this particular interregional TC project for disease detection and surveillance and uh, PCR equipment and other consumables um, and disinfection materials are um, were already um, included in procurements during the last year, right after the request from the Andean community. And now we continue it through the current TC project. And alongside of that, we are we um, I need to be urgently starting um, in um, multiple countries participating in that. 
project, breeding and genetic res resistance um, studies. And then we're also supporting communication materials and others. Um, in um, March, we held a meeting as well as a global research symposium at which um, the World Banana Forum and Victor and Matthews, as well as um, several colleagues here um, participated and talked about and that was in association during that same week of the launch of the interregional project um, for the first time in Quito. And now we are just gearing up and ramping up and uh, really starting to deliver on that. With that, I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. And this is just a representation of the laboratories that we have in Cyberstoff. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions provided that Victor and Matthews think that there is time. Otherwise, I'll wait in line later. I think we have uh, some, some time. Of course, questions are supposed to be addressed also using the, the questions and answers section. But I have a question for you, Soba. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation and, and brief because you do many other activities. This is only just a, a small piece of the work you are doing. Um, but I wanted to know, do, do you have any information on the um, organoleptic uh, conditions of priorities, for example, the, this one set J4 that you presented, you've been working with uh, Dr. Zhang Yu Ji on uh, in China. Is there, do you have any result on, on those plans? Um, yeah. Um, so those are the plants that we saw in the picture during that very last um, um, research coordination meeting. I think that was in uh, 2019 or 2020. And I also understand from uh, Professor Yi earlier on that it is under mass multiplication and a, a distribution to farmers. And um, I'm actually looking forward to hear from him. And not just thank you for raising that question. So that was variety that was actually um, in multiplication for distribution to, uh, to farmers. At the same time, four other countries um, and institutions that pass participated in that project also had mutant lines that had putative, shown putative resistance. And we are following up on that as well. And this new project that is launched next year will bring uh, the continuity of those projects in-house. Absolutely. I am also really looking forward to see the, the activities that will be implemented in, in Latin America and the Caribbean and, and see how we can cooperate um, in the future on that. Um, okay, I think that at this stage, most probably we'll have more questions. I don't know if Mateus would like has uh, any questions. Otherwise, maybe we can continue with Dr. Uh, G. Mateus, any questions? Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for... Yes, do, 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 Dr. G, one, one second, please. Uh, yes, one, one moment, Dr. G. Mateus, uh, please, do you have any questions? I had one question, a quick question to Dr. Shoba. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I would like to ask, uh, among the different types of mutagenesis techniques, which one you consider that is more suitable to provide resistance to FOC TR4? And which one you had better results? Easier. Have you been able to use both gamma rays and um, X rays in inside in here? And um, um, Dr. Yi, I believe, used EMS mutagenesis, and the other community, other groups, actually used um, gamma ray radiation as well. So you just tone down the radiation doses to the levels that can be acceptable to the tissue culture material. You would use a much higher dose for seed material, but this can be much lower. So wherever a facility is available as an X-ray facility or a gamma ray facility, you can use. We do not promote the uh, chemical mutagenesis just because of the chemical nature um, and the use of it in developing countries, but th that also gives really good results. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shova. Uh, please, Mateus, if we can continue. Um, I think it's uh, there are other questions, Mateus. Are we, are we done with this section? Mm -hmm. No, no questions. No. Okay, good. Then um, thanks again uh, for the for the presentation, Soba. Then we can continue with now Dr. Ji uh, Gan Yun. He is the vice president of the Guangdong Academy of Agricultural Sciences in 
Guangzhou, uh, China, and he's working in the National Banana Breeding Center. He has ex extensive experience in the genetic research of bananas, including genetic transformation, gen editing, and breeding techniques. He will present his research on the development of TR4 resistant varieties. Dr. Yi, please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Victor, thank you very, thank you very much for your introduction and uh, to Lima to invite me to join this important uh, meeting. I want to, to give the present, presentation the targets of research advancement on the development of a tropical for resistant and a longer shape by banana varieties. Yes, I come from China from the National Banana Breeding Center and also the key lab on tropical and the subtropical growth stabilization utilization. This is uh, located in Bondo Academy of Agriculture Sciences. Next, please. So as for the banana industry in China, we uh, uh, average, we plan earlier is about about uh, uh, 400,000 hectares and uh, it's planted in the Guangdong, Guangxi, Yunnan, Hainan, and the Fuji province. This province is located in southern China and the yield is about 2 million pounds per year. Almost 90% of the cultivar is carbon rich. Oh, Dr. Yi. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you one second. Um, interpretation colleagues are asking whether it is possible for you to use perhaps a microphone. Do you have a headset that you could use if it's oh, okay? okay? Because no, the problem, if, if you are too far from the computer, it, it creates an echo that makes the interpretation complicated. And I'm afraid that we have many participants uh, who speak Spanish. So it will be interesting for everybody oh. if you could kindly okay. or maybe closer to the computer okay good okay, okay. yes so, thank you okay please uh, continue okay yes i think so let's 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 try thank oh, you okay thank you and uh, so uh, uh, the banana industry in china is the plant area is uh, uh, 400,000 hectares it's located in guangdong Guangxi, Yunnan. China and the Fujian provinces. So the yield is about 2 million tons. Most of the cultivar is uh, Cavendish planters. Next, please. So, you know, Susanna Wilt is also very, very serious in, uh, in China. You know, uh, the first case was found in Taiwan in 1989. And then the first case in mainland China is in 1996 in Guangdong province. This is uh, very near to our academy. And then this, this disease transferred to Guangxi province. And then to Yunnan. So, so now almost all, all of the banana plant area not, uh, is uh, Infected by the Pasani uh, milk. Uh, so, so you know, this is uh, very serious now. And uh, I don't know why the. Uh, okay. So, you look from 1998 to 2020, the infected area increased very quickly. Next, please. Next, please. So this is in Yunnan, in the highland uh, mountain, high mountain, high sea level mountain. You look, this, uh, the, this is the you know, uh, traditional banana plant area, you know, just because of the salivary effect. So a lot of trees be, 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 be killed, you know. So this is a uh, uh, very high infected rate. Next, please. So 
I want to introduce the resistant varieties uh, reading. So we use metagenesis. Uh, you know, it's a multiple bias. We use N N N3 EMS, and then we also use embryogenic colors, and then we breed the new cultivar. This is the process. Next. So uh, after we get uh, some new seedlings, we plant in the in the greenhouse, and then we use very high, very heavy uh, fungi, you know, to pull to this uh, this uh, seedlings, and then we select some survival seedlings, and then we plant them in the in the field. And then we select some healthy seedlings and then we propagate it. Next. Next, please. And uh, so this is a final we selection some uh, uh, variation from the Bashi. This is uh, this is the individual. COI 16 uh, induction. You know, this, this cultivar is uh, a moderate resistant to uh, tropical S4. This branch is, uh, is very good. And uh, the finger shape is also very good. And uh, the quality test and also sweet smelling part. The TSS content is uh, 22%, TA is 0%. Two eight percent SS is eighteen point eight six percent. So this cultivar, no, uh, in China we have a, a plant uh, a almost uh, almost uh, a, a twenty hectares. And uh, next please. Next please. Okay, so this is in the very high infected area. This is in Donghua, it's very near to our academy. You can, uh, you can look this place. This is a, a, you know, this is the first year. This is a local one, and we call Bashi. This is a AAA top Cavendish planners, and in the first year infected very seriously. And uh, the second year, you will, you will look. All, all of over, over, almost uh, 60 percent to 80 percent is died, be finished, and then uh, ZG4 is still can uh, survive up to 95 percent. So this is a uh, ZG4 has a very good resistance to chip core less four. Next, please. So yes, so if you look here, so the production cycle is almost uh, uh, 360 uh, to 380 days. This is uh, almost the same as Bashi. This is a, 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 a main cultivar, a Cavendish banana cultivar in China. And uh, the plant height is almost the same. The bunch weight is a little bit uh, lower. Uh, per hectare yield is almost a little bit year, uh, year lower, and uh, the number of plants per month is six to eight, the same as Bashi, and the finger number of fingers per bunch is uh, 142, and the fungal weight is uh, uh, 176 grams, and the uh, floor length is twenty-three uh, one point. Point one. So the color is a worry, and uh, also natural growth field color is bright yellow. So also very sweet. So and the infection area, you know, until today it's almost ten years past. The the uh, the area, the expanding plant areas here, the infection 
uh, infected rate is still lower than uh, uh, almost five uh, percent. So compare the CK is up to fifty percent to eight percent. So this is a good cause. And also, I should mention here that in China, there's uh, uh, some as a sign as some scientists still need some uh, good uh, cultivar is very you also high resistance uh, to to sunny wheat typical as four. So now uh, in China, we don't think the for sunny wheat now is a, a serious problem because we. Uh, now it's uh, why you using uh, the the resistant cultivar now, and uh, also we find that the the culture cultivation technology is also very important. If you use we use uh, uh, GAP and uh, price the resistant cultivar, I think well, we we find we can solve the problem. Next, please. So as uh, in the you know we also develop some uh, very good uh, you know screening technology. This is uh, uh, actually by uh, it's by uh, Dr. Wu. He this is a uh, we call a rapid, rapid screening of a uh, species from resistance to salivary in uh, in vitro biocide. So, so far, there's two types of early bios away for screen uh, mucide general types against the uh, uh, Tocolis 4 and a uh, greenhouse and uh, or you watch bioassay. So, this is a uh, very good technology I will introduce. Next, please. So, this is, you know, for step, step one. We use the spore suspension uh, with the sealed water is of, of the uh, 10,000 and uh, 100,000 clean gel in milliliter, and then put the field paper discus, and uh, each plant is incorporated by placing one disc on the surface of the MIS, MIS medium. So we plant the seedlings. Here and then we can find the six score for the standard of grading. So one is no discoloration of the phosphodiesterin, and uh, second two, a uh, score two is uh, you know half of the of the, the head of the uh, phosphodiesterin discolored, and this is. Uh, uh, more than uh, half, and uh, score four is fifty percent, and uh, five is uh, fifty percent of the leaves white or yellow, and uh, six is the uh, hoyo planted in the witty. So this is a very good technology. And then next, please. So we use this to calculate. So it's the level of resistance to the sunny wheat. Next, please. Okay, so actually we joined the CIP just uh, so far, just uh, introduced uh, earlier. We we write uh, chapter three by Ms. Wu is, uh, and me. Uh, this is we call free screening of plant genotype for sunny wheat resistance by using in which you by your side. So you look here, this is a cultivar. We call bus is uh, uh, Cavendish bananas. This is 119, 218. Actually, this is uh, from Sala from Taiwan. And uh, and the Nunku, Nunku number one, this is a moderate resistance cultivar. If you will look this, the field evaluation and the greenhouse by your side, and also use our technology in which you by your say you look is almost can get the same re result. You look here, this is a bash is higher susceptible, susceptible 
and the 119 heart resistance, even in Korean host, is of resistance, is in which your bio says also higher resistance. So this technology is very useful for the early selection of uh, our breeding. And uh, also, this is a uh, Dongguan Zajio, we call it this uh, plantain, is very high resistance, and the in which is also high resistance. Okay, next please. So not only we use the uh, conventional breeding, uh, recently we uh, do some very interesting research work is we call post-induced gene silence of tropical race 4 EIG1 is 11 gene genes with super resistance to fusarium yield of bananas. So this paper was published in uh, PPG. So, we we clone some genes from the you know uh, we use in the proteomics analysis and then the genes actually is from uh, from the fungi and then we introduce uh, trans the genes to the bananas and then we find we can get very higher resistance uh, 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 bananas so not because this one is a uh, we use two materials. One is Cavendish bananas, Bashi, is uh, with a, a resistant rate. The, the infect, infected rate is almost 20%. It's allowed than 20%. And uh, also, you know, because this genes is also exist in uh, tropical race one, and then we change this genes to Gross Michel. And the look here, the gross Michel is also higher resistance to tropical S1 and S4. So this is a very interesting work. You know, even the uh, you know the history, the, the main uh, hemobin fight with the fungi from uh, from less one to less four during the last more than one hundred years. And then we use this this high gas technology. We can we can uh, get resistance uh, very uh, cultural uh, from cross uh, uh, machine. So now, back up, uh, so the, the for the economic trees, economic trees, uh, the plant, the head, the finger is also it's the same as cross uh, machine. So a uh, so in the last three years, we find it very good, but uh, actually this is uh, transgenic. So we still need get permission from the government. Next, please. Okay, not only for the uh, resistance, the cultural beating, recently we have uh, some very useful uh, work, research work on the crispr cas Mediated general editing of uh, uh, SEO1. This is promoted the uh, share flag for banana growth. We edit the SEO1 gene, and the, you know, this is a CK, this is a Cavendish banana. You look here in 22 degree condition, we store the share flag is, is in the run uh, temperature 22 degree. The CK is 20 day, 21 days. And uh, you look after gene editor, we can get the shape life of the banana can up to 80 days. You know, this is in uh, room temperature in 22 degrees. So if you look this, uh, we use S and then we uh, ask for treatment, you can, you can find the banana can arrive in normally and uh, almost the same as CK. So, and we find that this is because the gene editing uh, a client, the, you know, the insulin, you know, it's declined almost, you know, in 21 days, it's a natural laughing, the CK lock here is, uh, uh, 
with the S rates are very high. But uh, for the extra plant to look here, it's almost 20 days or 70 days and uh, it's the same level. So reduce almost 70, 90% of the S rate. Uh, you know, this is a very uh, useful technology. We also published in the PPG. Everyone, you are, somebody, if you are interested, you can uh, download the paper. So I just introduced my, our research work, including uh, uh, the conventional breeding and uh, you know transgenic uh, breeding, and also uh, some uh, uh, for, uh, for the longer shelf life banana breeding. So we our our project was uh, supported by the National Science Foundation and also the National Key uh, Program of banana Program uh, of, uh, of China. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ji Yangun. Highly appreciated. Um, I think we can rescue quick uh, the first question formulated in the questions and answers section. Um, Dr. Ji Yangun, I'm going to read the question. There is the possibility that the mobilization of tolerant plants, tolerant means not resistant, only tolerant, as uh, the, the one that you mentioned, um, is there a possibility that, this, uh, that there is a latent infection of a uh, TR4 uh, may serve as a pathway to spread the pathogen? Do you understand the question? Maybe I can formulate it in another way. Can, uh, do, can do I you, do, the story? Yes. Do, do you think that um, if we mobilize a plant which is, yeah. which is uh, tolerant but not resistant, therefore has the fungus, if we take that plant to an area where there's no TR4, do you think that the, the pathogen can spread because there's a TR4 in that uh, tolerant variety? Oh, you, you mean uh, if this is a uh, plant, this is a tolerant, tolerant plant, you just ask me the, the, the fungus can uh, develop or not? Yes, well, this is a recurrent question that uh, the scientists are, are formulating now. If, if, if you move a plant that is tolerant, but infected yeah. with TR4, and you put it in a plantation where there is no fungus, that will spread the fungus. No? That plant is tolerant, but maybe, maybe that field it is not. So either you plant everything with a new variety or... Yeah, that's that's the question oh, okay. for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but in China, we almost uh, of, uh, most of the farmers we plant the tissue cultural tissue cultural plant. Mm -hmm. So not uh, not never uh, almost nobody use uh, sucker. So, okay. So this is not a problem. And uh, you know, I actually uh, in China all the uh, banana plant area now is uh, being affected uh, by the fungus everywhere. So this is a very mm -hmm. serious problem. Yeah. If, uh, uh, you know, even the farmers almost, uh, you know, they plant two or three years and uh, then they remove to another place to find planet. Okay. Good. Okay, Dr. Ji Jun, thank you very much for your uh, presentation today. There will be more questions in the questions and answers section that you can reply if you consider it appropriate, uh, write in your reply. And, and again, thank you very much for your participation in our webinar today. Then we thank are you. a bit, thank you. We are a bit behind schedule. So I would like now to present our next panelist, Dr. Edson Perito Amorim. He's a researcher in the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation in Brapa, and has extensive experience in genetic improvement, biotechnology, quantitative genetics, molecular markers, biostatics, and biometrics. The focus of his work is to develop technolog technological solutions to meet the demand of bananas and plantain producers, especially cultivars with resistance to pests and diseases, with emphasis on, of course, Pusarium will raise one and raise four together with Black Sikatoka. He will present the development and evaluation of banana varieties with resistance to fusarium wilt. Doctor, your yeah, screen is yours. Thank you. You can speak both English and Spanish as you consider. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. Are you sharing my screen? One moment. 
Do you hear me? You can hear your sound unclear. There's a little yeah. bit of echo that might disturb our interpreters, but I, I think it should be fine. Uh, okay. See you on my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Oh, uh, okay. Sounds good. Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening for everyone around the world. I would like to thank uh, the World Banana Forum for the invitation. My name is Edson Amorim. I am the leader for the Banana Genetic Improvement Program at Embrapa in Brazil. And today I'm going to talk about uh, our strategy for developing good virus thanks to uh, Fusarium wilt. So uh, Fusarium, uh, specifically race one, is the main disease in banana in Brazil. And it is present in the main production areas Major cultivars are susceptible, including Prata as a AAB genome and the silk types. Normally, Brazil produces uh, around uh, 7 million tons of uh, banana per year on the 500,000 uh, hectares uh, for production. In this context, uh, the development of uh, cultivars tends to FOC is a strategy to control of this uh, disease. Our uh, breeding program is based on the crossbreeding carried out every day. We have uh, produced more than 700,000 seeds in the last 46 years. And we have uh, released more than 10 hybrids, all uh, resident to design on race one and many also resistance to black cigatoka and nematodes, uh, for instance. In this picture, here is the Princesa as a silk type hybrid, resistant to Fuzari 1. Remember, the silk, the original silk, is completely susceptible for this uh, disease. This uh, hybrid, which is replacing the original silk in Brazil, and uh, this hybrid has been evaluated in Africa by the IATA uh, with an uh, excellent results and uh, will be evaluated by Corbana in Costa Rica and uh, Augura in Colombia for export soon. Embrapa has a very efficient protocols for evaluation new hybrids for instance to Zion in the field and in the greenhouse. We have a, one of fusarium infested area where we evaluate the internal and external symptoms of the disease. The silk cultivar is used as a control around the new hybrid and the scale is used to classify the genotype as a resident or susceptible. In a greenhouse, we evaluate on the new hybrids for inoculation with an FOC isolate classified as susceptible subtropical race four. Uh, the cultivar silk is used as a control and the evaluation is complete at uh, 90 days using a great scale developed by Embrapa. So uh, we compare the field and the greenhouse results and uh, identify the high correlation, confirming the efficiency of the protocol using at Embrapa at this moment. This uh, probably and the uh, only work that uh, compares field and uh, greenhouse uh, condition. Embrapa uses uh, six strategies to develop uh, new hybrids. Uh, I will present uh, them and uh, some results from the last uh, two years. Uh, remember, we have uh, more than 45 years of uh, banana desertion at uh, Brazil. The first strategy is to develop an improving diploid for use in the process. Improving diploids as a, a key of the success from the banana breeding. Our resistant uh, development uh, improving diploid by Embrapa are resistant to Fusarium race one. Some are resistant to black cigatoc, nematodes, weevil, have a tolerance to low temperature and the water density, for instance. Uh, in this table are some uh, our new improving diploids. 
all are FOC resistant, race one resistant. Some are also resistant to FOC tier four. In this case, this information by uh, SNP marker. In addition uh, to FOC resistant, some deploys are resistant to black Sigma talk, have uh, more than 100 fruit per bunch and uh, uh, low height. Those deploys are at this moment in Colombia for tests to FOC tier four in collaboration from the AgroSavia. The second strategy, as, as the, the main important, is the, the using but uh, improving deployed in cross from the commercial fruit bars aiming to develop uh, new hybrids. In this uh, slide, we have some new hybrids developed by Ibrapa. We developed basically Prata and Silk hybrids. And uh, most recently, the development of uh, Cavendish types is carried out um, through international collaboration or international partnership. The first is partnership is uh, on Corbona. Uh, and in Rapa, we have a uh, project aiming to develop of uh, Cavendish type hybrids. And the uh, first crossing, we will start in July of this year. And this project have uh, five years. We started in 2020, in October 2020, and we're finishing in 2025. And the second project is in collaboration of uh, Agrosavia and Augura in Colombia. And uh, the main purpose is to develop uh, Cavendish type hybrids, resistance to TR4 and as soon as possible, and uh, resistance to Black Sigatok. And this project is starting in December of the 2021. Um, the third strategy used by Ibrapa is the chromosome doubling using a uh, coach sign. You have a uh, severe auto tetraploidance developed from the different white uh, diploids, including uh, Cavendish relatives. In this uh, photo, we have uh, some auto tetraploids in uh, agronomic evaluation at this moment in the experimental station. Uh, here in Brazil. And uh, also auto tetraploids in crosses with uh, improving diploids aiming to develop a new hybrids. And uh, finally, uh, new, new triploids hybrids, uh, the general genome AAA, and the field evaluation at this moment here in Brazil. Uh, the in vitro somatoclonal evaluation is the first strategy used by Brapa. And uh, at this moment, you have uh, 11 Cavendish and uh, six Prata somatoclones head states to subtropical race four. Those somatoclones will be evaluated in Colombia in collaboration from AgroSavia for resistance to TR4 uh, soon. Are we planning to send the problem in this year? These uh, summer clones to Colombia and to start the evaluation, um, start the next year, probably. And uh, the induction of the mutants by radiation is the fit strategy used uh, by Embrapa in collaboration with the uh, in, uh, International Agents of uh, Atomic Energy. Uh, the first Cavendish plants will be radiation in July of this year uh, in the Atomic Energy Center for agriculture at the University of Sao Paulo. Prata, Williams, and the Valley will be irradiated. The main objective, of course, is to develop a mutants resistance to TR4. And the sixth strategy used by Embrapa is the genetic edition starting in 2020. And we are using genes, genes associated with our resistance to Fusarium race one identified by Embrapa and some genes from TF4. Uh, the cultivar used in this uh, case is the Prata time because it's the most important uh, banana type 
for Brazilian uh, agriculture. So, and I will present, um, of course, in, on overview about of uh, Embrapa's banana genetic improving breeding program. I would like to thank uh, for, for your attention. And if you have any question, I am ready to respond. Thank you so much for your attention. Perfect. Dr. Edson Amorin, thank you very much for your participation, for your presentation. It's been a, that was an excellent um, brief on the activities you are doing in Embrapa. I am mindful of the time, and I guess that maybe we can perhaps reply to questions in the QA section. Um, and if you don't mind, we will continue with the um, with our next panelist. Then we will uh, start the new section um, uh, with Raisa Jauger. Mrs. Raisa Jauger is an, an agricultural officer on tropical fruits in the sub regional office for uh, Mesoamerica, uh, based in Panama. She coordinates the regional initiative uh, Sustainable and Resilient Agriculture and is the regional focal point for the uh, subjects to agricultural health and food safety. Prior to FAO, she worked as a researcher at the Research Institute in Tropical Fruit Growing in the Ministry of Agriculture in Cuba. For 23, for 23 years in research related to agroeconomic, agronomic management and diagnosis of diseases that affect fruit trees of which she was the general director until 2014. Raisa, querida, la pantalla es tuya. Adelante. Sí, bueno. Buenos días a todos y todas. Muchas gracias, Víctor y Mateo. Así todo al World Banana Forum por esta invitación eh, a compartir los esfuerzos que estamos haciendo en América Latina y Caribe esfuerzos que no solo son de nuestra oficina de FAO, ni eh, World Banana Forum, la CIPF, también es el esfuerzo de eh, los organismos internacionales, de las ORPF, de la ONPF, de la academia, del sector privado. Entonces, en ganas de ganar eh, tiempo, pues estamos ya un poco atrasados con la agenda y tenemos 10 minutos para presentación. Siguiente, Mateos. Eh, hemos venido desarrollando una agenda, como les comentaba, con amplia participación de todos los equipos nacionales de, de los países, asimismo con el sector privado y por su parte también todo esto está alineado al nuevo marco de programación estratégico de la FAO y en este sentido en los temas de sanidad agropecuaria y con énfasis para sanidad vegetal y en específico para el manejo de la marchitez pofusarium en su raza cuatro tropical, hemos venido trabajando y avanzando en los temas de eh, gestión de riesgo, hemos venido también trabajando en todos los temas para la, la prevención, eh, fuertemente en el fortalecimiento de capacidades en nuestra región. Siguiente. Siguiente, Mateos. Entonces, bueno, eh, eh, hemos realizado un grupo de acciones, eh, en este caso también en estrecha vinculación con el OIRSA y las ONPF, con la eh, participación de diferentes actores, tanto del sector público como del sector privado, eh, eh, haciendo énfasis en los simulacros de adaptación para la prevención de FOC R4T en los diferentes países de la región, tanto de Mesoamérica como el cono sur, así también Caribe. Siguiente. Entonces, eh, con este esfuerzo realizado, eh, los simulacros obviamente han permitido el fortalecimiento de la capacidad en los temas de vigilancia, epidemiología y manejo de, de la enfermedad y así también poner a punto todos los actores claves en, en la cadena de las musáceas y de esta manera poder fortalecer eh, de manera articulada y coordinada todas las instituciones a nivel de país. Siguiente. En Mesoamérica también traba hemos, trabajamos, eh, tenemos actualmente un proyecto subregional 
en, en articulación con el OIRSA y la CECAC y, y hemos también y tenemos un nuevo proyecto para la subregión de Mesoamérica. Eh, con esto hemos tenido los resultados como anterior proyecto en, en, en hacer el plan de acción para la prevención, detección y respuesta ante la machitez por fusario en la raza cuatro tropical y actualmente estamos trabajando con el nuevo proyecto subregional en los temas vinculados a la gestión de riesgo para marchitez por fusarium en su raza cuatro tropical. Y también con el OIRSA, eh, con la carta, con el memorando de entendimiento que tenemos eh, firmado y tenemos una carta de acuerdo con el OIRSA también, que estamos trabajando en temas vinculados ya más a las innovaciones y a una plataforma para eh, los temas eh, ya directamente con prevención eh, de la enfermedad, vinculados con eh, la articulación para las variables climáticas y otros elementos importantes. Siguiente. En la región eh, trabajamos con los países en los planes de acciones nacionales, Actualmente también tenemos un proyecto para la comunidad andina que en este caso eh, eh, trabajamos para Perú, Bolivia, Colombia y Ecuador, eh, básicamente fortaleciendo todo lo que es las capacidades y eh, revisando también y actualizando los planes de acciones eh, nacionales en los diferentes eh, ejes principales que, te, que tienen estos planes de acciones nacionales. De igual manera también hemos, eh, con este proyecto de eh, la comunidad andina, también eh, estamos revisando algunos temas de fortalecimiento de capacidades para la región en estos cuatro países. Siguiente. En estos planes de acciones nacionales, con el equipo que tenemos en nuestra oficina de SLM, compuesto por la doctora Esther Lilia Peralta y el doctor Jaime Cárdenas, estamos eh, trabajando eh, vinculados directamente con nuestros países, revisando todos los temas de bioseguridad, vigilancia, eh, todo lo referente a la capacidad institucional, la respuesta ante la enfermedad, también temas eh, vinculados con la comunicación de riesgo y de esta manera poder hacer sugerencias, eh, actualizaciones y articulaciones con los países que brinden un soporte para eh, poder eh, mejorar o actualizar en dependencia del de el momento y la situación en que se encuentre el, el país estos planes de acciones nacionales. Y también eh, fortaleciendo eh, muchísimo, también fortaleciendo todo lo vinculado a la gestión de riesgo. Siguiente. Entonces, por otra parte, nos encontramos y esperemos que eh, finalizando el año eh, podamos hacer el lanzamiento. Estamos trabajando en un curso sobre buenas prácticas para la gestión de riesgos fitosanitarias con nuestro grupo de RLC, que eh, esperemos sea su lanzamiento para octubre de este año. Y es de las metas grandes que tenemos, creo que en Sanidad Vegetal es un, un reto este curso que, que estamos eh, realizando de conjunto también con otros actores a nivel de América Latina y Caribe. De igual manera continuamos con todo lo vinculado a los talleres y jornadas eh, fitosanitarias. Próximamente vamos a tener en coordinación con el OIRSA y la SECA un taller eh, vinculado con la vigilancia y otro taller con la gestión de riesgo. Obviamente con los expertos de nuestra región, de los países de nuestra región y con la participación de nuestras ORPF. Siguiente. Por otra parte, eh, eh, y un poco trayendo a coalición el tema que hoy estamos tratando en este webinario, en, en, en el tema de fortalecimiento de capacidades se realizó, por ejemplo, con Ecuador una sesión de intercambio técnico con la participación del INIAP, el Ministerio de la Agricultura y el CIAP Biodiversity y también eh, vinculado con todo lo que está relacionado con el tema de variedades resistentes y cómo dar respuesta para eh, esta amenaza de FOC R4T. Siguiente. 
En el fortalecimiento de capacidades también hemos, eh, por supuesto, eh, esto es un esfuerzo conjunto a nivel de toda nuestra región, de América Latina y Caribe, y, y quisiera siempre resaltar el esfuerzo de todos nuestros expertos a nivel de la, de la región y de las instituciones del sector académico, del sector privado, para realizar todos estos talleres, estos webinarios, que finalmente lo que hacemos es lecciones aprendidas hoy de eh, los países, por supuesto, que tienen la presencia de la enfermedad y también de eh, los restantes países en cuanto a la preparación en prevención, diagnóstico, epidemiología y también, por supuesto, las investigaciones que hoy realizan nuestras instituciones científicas a nivel de América Latina y Caribe. Siguiente. Entonces, continuamos con eh, nuestro proyecto de la comunidad andina, que para los cuatro países de la comunidad andina, fortaleciendo capacidades en el tema de bioseguridad con la entrega de kits o reactivos para el diagnóstico en nuestros países y también kits de bioseguridad para pequeños productores. Uno de los ejes fundamentales que tenemos a nivel de América Latina y Caribe eh, de FAO en articulación con las restantes eh, instituciones es fortalecer todo el trabajo a nivel de nuestros pequeños productores. Siguiente. Entonces, bueno, todos tienen ya online, de hecho, recientemente hicimos unos pequeños intercambios también con la estrategia y el plan de acción regional que se elaboró para FOC R4T, que fue un proceso bien participativo con buena articulación entre el sector público y privado, y lo, lo que nos corresponde ahora es, y van a ser los siguientes pasos, es articular, eh, continuar mejorando aún las, las articulaciones en nuestra región sobre los temas que vamos a abordar para poder dar cumplimiento a esta estrategia y este plan de acción regional, tanto a nivel de nuestros países también, como las acciones que hacemos los organismos eh, internacionales. Siguiente. Eh, ya no, eh, como lo hemos comentado en otros escenarios y ya en fase de culminación, obviamente eh, trabajando en intercambio con, los con todos nuestros países, estamos eh, culminando el proyecto para la comunidad andina vinculado directamente en prevención y control de la machitez por fusario para nuestros, nuestros países de eh, Ecuador, Perú, Bolivia y Colombia. Pero eh, estos proyectos, como siempre decimos, aunque es un proyecto para la comunidad andina, todas estas acciones que nosotros venimos desarrollando to, eh, también pues, eh, se, se pueden articular con otros países de la región, sobre todo en las acciones que hacemos a nivel de fortalecimiento de capacidades en nuestros países. Siguiente. Eh, seguimos con un tema muy, un eje de, principal que trabajamos en nuestros proyectos, todo lo vinculado a la gestión y comunicación del riesgo, se sigue haciendo artículos, comunicando todas las acciones a nivel de América Latina y Caribe con el tema de FOC R4T, siguiente. Y eh, obviamente está disponible también a nivel de, de, de nuestra página web, de los diferentes eh, canales que tienen para la comunicación, diferentes videos, contenidos que hoy se genera para los temas de eh, FOC R4T. Siguiente. Ahora bien. Eh, para culminar, eh, una pequeña reflexión que queremos hacer y porque hemos venido discutiendo en diferentes escenarios con nuestros países toda la importancia que tiene eh, el ingreso a nuestros países de eh, material eh, vegetal y por supuesto también los protocolos que hoy se siguen a nivel de las ONPF y de las ORPF para el ingreso de estos materiales, y agradecemos muchísimo también a Foro Mundial Bananero, que ha venido poniendo en esto un foco importante, un eje prioritario, y como hemos podido ver en estos webinarios, todas las investigaciones que hoy se tienen, los proyectos con el cual se trabaja también de otras instituciones a nivel de América Latina y Caribe, y todo esto finalmente lo que va a traer es 
poder conseguir cada vez más un ingreso seguro a nuestra región de todos estos materiales, lo cual tiene una gran importancia desde el punto de vista cuarentenario y evitaríamos también la entrada de otras plagas que son de importancia para nuestra región. O sea, se trata de continuar trabajando de una manera biosegura con todo este tema de eh, lo que es la importación de materiales vegetales. Siguiente. De esta manera, como siempre decimos, FOC-R4T es uno de nuestros desafíos más importantes que llevamos en la agenda fitosanitaria a nivel de América Latina y Caribe, por lo que debemos continuar realizando estas alianzas estratégicas entre las diferentes instituciones científicas, no solo de América Latina y Caribe, sino a, a nivel global y todo lo vinculado al mejoramiento genético eh, en cuanto a las musancias con una participación muy importante de las instituciones científicas en nuestra región de América Latina y Caribe. Siguiente. Y bueno, para ganar tiempo y, eh, y espacio con la agenda también, como siempre de decimos y hace tres semanas hicimos reunión con algunas instituciones de de y organismos internacionales de nuestra región, lo importante es lograr cada vez más una mejor coordinación e integración para eh, poder articular de una manera mayor eficiente los recursos que tenemos disponibles, que tampoco es que se tengan eh, todos los recursos que quisiéramos, pero si nos articulamos es un mensaje muy importante, si logramos coordinarnos, pues nuestros esfuerzos llegarían mucho mejor a los países de, de nuestra región. Y por supuesto también eh, fortalecer las capacidades para nuestros países de la región es uno de los grandes ejes prioritarios y poder llegar también a nuestros pequeños eh, productores con toda eh, esta, esta desafiante tarea que tenemos a nivel de América Latina, para algunos países la contención, para otros países continuar manejando de la mejor manera FOC-R4T. Siguiente. Muchas gracias, Víctor y Mateos, por la invitación y compartir este espacio con el Foro Mundial Bananero. Y bueno, siempre, como les digo, somos un gran equipo con todas las acciones que vamos realizando a nivel de nuestra región de América Latina y Caribe. Querida Raísa, muchísimas gracias, eh, como es habitual, por tu elocuencia y, y excelente presentación, además del innumerable número de actividades que desarrolláis en la región que son eh, en beneficio de tantos y tantos productores. Muchísimas gracias. Ahora mismo no hay preguntas y teniendo en cuenta, como has dicho, el, el tiempo que tenemos eh, disponible, vamos a continuar con el siguiente eh, equipo también de FAO, el, el IPPC, eh, y si hay preguntas las responderemos al final. I, voy a pasar al inglés ahora para interpretación. Um, so, the next um, panelist is... A... Sorry, let me change the language here. The next uh, panelist is uh, Sarah Brunel. She has 20 years of progressive national, regional, and global experience in plant protection, pest, and disease control policies and legislation, implementation of the standards for phytosanitary measures, as well as environmental protection and capacity development. She is currently the uh, acting officer in charge for implementation facilitation unit activities such as staffing, budgeting, and resource mobilization. She is in charge of coordination of the implementation, facilitation, and capacity development activities, including uh, coordination of the IC, development of guides and training materials, management of projects, improvement of the PCE, addressing emergency pests, um, and implementation of all projects in the uh, IPPC, the International Plant Protection Convention Secretariat. Together with Sara, we have today also Mr. Camilo Beltran Montoya. Uh, he is an engineer and in agriculture and holds a master's degree in plant protection. Before joining the IPPC Secretariat, he worked at the regional level for the Andean Regional Phytosanitary Agency, 
or it's uh, mainly a performing activities of the sub-regional trade, pest of regional concern and regional laws for registering the agricultural use of uh, chemical pesticides. He also worked at the national level for the Colombian National Phytosanitary Agency, specifically in aspects related to updating the list of pests and the official certification of the phytosanitary status. So that being said, I would like to uh, pass the floor to um, Sara. Muchas gracias, Victor, para la invitación. Y Mateus, uh, estamos um, muy felices de estar con, vos, con vosotros. Y ahora voy a, a continuar en inglés. Um, so next slide, please. So here is the outline we will be sharing with you. We are mindful of time. A uh, very brief uh, background on the impact of pests, um, what we are dealing with in terms of plant, plant products and regulated articles. What is the IPPC? Uh, then uh, working with ISPMs and the concrete activities we're undertaken on uh, Fusarium Tropical Race 4. And this will be a two voices presentation with Camilo. Next slide, please. So, well, you all know that we're in a globalized world. There's an increase of uh, movement of good people. There's global warning. So pests are increasingly moving and we need as the International Plant Protection Convention uh, to take action to prevent the introduction and spread of pests more than before, as indeed pests cause 40% of all food crops losses and that's a tremendous amount of uh, money. Next, please. So the convention or International Plant Protection Convention uh, deals with um, plants, plant products, and regulated articles. These are the, let's say, object of the convention. And these articles uh, are the object of regulations by the conventions. And the convention aims at ensuring safe trade and to prevent uh, the introduction and spread of pests. And the way to do that is through the National, Report, uh, National Plant Protection Organization, which are the bodies in charge of setting um, the institution, the structure, the funds, um, and to set as well uh, legislation and regulations to regulate uh, pests and quarantine pests. Next slide, please. So indeed, we are very well placed to be working on tier four as this is considered a quarantine pest in many countries of the world as the IPPC is a sole um, international treaty to secure cooperation among nations in protecting global plant resources. Um, there are to date 184 members and um, the IPPC has two sisters organization, which are the Codex Alimentarius and the uh, OIE or um, International Animal Health Organizations. And we work globally uh, hand in hand with 10 regional plant protection organization and over 40 international organizations. And in uh, the region of uh, LAC, you already have one, two, three, four, five, five RPPOs of four, five, I think five, well, you have a lot of RPPOs, so you're used to uh, coordination. Next slide, please. The convention establishes and publishes international standards for phytosanitary measures. Each year there are new ones. Uh, the new topics are defined by the contracting parties, so 47 ISPMs to date as well as phytosanitary treatments and diagnostic protocols. And you can find them on our international phytosanitary portal, which is our website. And you have the link indicated on that slide. Next, please. And I also want really to emphasize the fact that um, we are, um, Camilo and myself, working for the implementation and facilitation unit. And uh, in that respect, we're developing guides and training materials. So there's a lot of guides. You see there's a 
titles, example of titles, because we have more than 20, which are freely available that you can consult on the IPP. And more and more, we are going uh, into e-learning courses, uh, trying to be very efficient and to be interactive for our target audience. Um, you see here some e-learning courses are indicated. I want to report that we just uh, issued a new e-learning course on pest risk analysis uh, for this time. So it's a self-learning course, but it will also be tutored for um, one time. And we were very happy to have uh, participants from uh, Latin America. Um, to come, we have an e-learning course on surveillance and pest reporting, as well as an e-learning course on export certification and the next one to come on inspection. And we also finalizing our guide on contingency planning. So Raisa was uh, indicating in her presentation the fact that there will be some um, trainings, things. So please go to our website as well. Take as much as you can. It's free. Take the courses. You will have a badge to state you've taken the course. Uh, and then that's reinforcing what happens at the regional level. Next slide, please. And uh, I now hand over to Camilo. Thank you very much, Shwara, for the interpreter. So I will continue in Spanish. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Eh, mi nombre es Camilo Beltrán, como ya lo mencionó Sara Brunel. Eh, para continuar con esta presentación y teniendo presente que previamente Sara ha mencionado que el comercio de plantas, productos eh, agrícolas y eh, productos reglamentados configuran un riesgo eh, o se reconoce el riesgo que configuran al mover estos artículos internacionalmente por la posibilidad de dispersar organismos, en particular plagas reglamentadas. Entonces vamos a introducir este concepto que son las plagas reglamentadas, que no son más que las plagas cuarentenarias y las plagas no cuarentenarias reglamentadas. En este caso muchos países pueden considerar o consideran que Fusarium TR4 es una plaga reglamentada por cuanto eh, aún puede estar ausente o aún estando presente pueda tener una distribución limitada. Es sujeto de, producto, de medidas fitosanitarias para cualquier vía. Se conoce el impacto que causaría en caso tal ingresara y eh, por supuesto una condición importante es que debe estar bajo control oficial. Es decir, que debe, debe estar bajo la tutela cuidado de eh, la Organización Nacional de Protección Fitosanitaria. Continuando con esto, también eh, queremos mostrar un poco las herramientas que tiene la CIPF que permiten entender un poco mejor cómo funciona el movimiento de plantas, productos vegetales y artículos reglamentados. Tenemos la NIMS 32, eh, que ayuda a las partes a categorizar un producto de acuerdo al riesgo que éste pueda configurar para dispersar plagas según su eh, uso previsto y también según el grado de procesamiento que hayan recibido. Para este caso, que es el caso que les concierne a la mayoría de personas que eh, están hoy participando, que son las plantas para plantar, es decir, materiales vegetales cuyo propósito son la propagación o la posterior plantación para producción, nos referiríamos a una categoría 4 según la NIF 32. Esto quiere decir que este tipo de productos deben ser sujetos de un análisis de riesgo de plagas para poder establecer cuáles son los riesgos asociados al movimiento o introducción de este tipo de materiales. Continuando con esto, la CIPF también cuenta con la NIMF número 11 que proporciona lineamientos para el análisis de riesgo de plagas eh, reglamentadas. Esto es sujeto de una previa categorización para que cada país determine si una plaga es cuarentenaria o no. Es decir, que cada país determinará si Fusarium TR4 o no le configura eh, o tiene la connotación de una plaga cuarentenaria. Más importante en este caso, o no más importante, pero igual de relevante a que Fusarium TR4 sea una plaga cuarentenaria, tiene que ver con las vías de ingreso. Y eh, en este sentido, la NIF número 11 reconoce diferentes puntos de inicio o diferentes criterios para iniciar un ARP. Uno de ellos entonces es la identificación de una plaga, pero también la identificación de una vía de ingreso. En este caso, eh, sería entonces eh, poner sobre la mesa o llamar la atención que eh, el movimiento de materiales vegetales eh, debería ser producto de un riguroso análisis de riesgo que 
contemple todas las fases y todos los riesgos que esto pueda prever, pero no solamente contemplar los riesgos que implique el movimiento de esto, poder tomar medidas apropiadas, medidas fitosanitarias que proporcionen un nivel adecuado de protección para eh, los países que importan estas partes y sin que ello configure en ningún momento una restricción al comercio. De esta manera podemos considerar o podemos decir también que las NIMF ayudan en el proceso general de una operación de comercio desde el análisis de riesgo de plagas que es necesario realizarlo cuando este no ha sido eh, llevado a cabo previamente y según los criterios de inicio que hayan, porque a través de esto se establecen los requisitos para importar una planta, producto eh, vegetal o artículo reglamentado. Una vez una parte eh, importadora, la parte importadora establece estos requisitos, cuando la parte exportadora va a realizar una operación debe certificar que su producto, en este caso supongamos fueran eh, materiales vegetales de, de banano, deben certificar que estos productos cumplen con las regulaciones para ser importadas al país importador, valga la redundancia y con los requisitos fitosanitarios. A su vez, cuando el país importador recibe eh, el producto, este llega a punto de ingreso, eh, es usual que se verifiquen eh, los requisitos de importación, o sea, haga una verificación del cumplimiento para detectar efectivamente si eh, el envío está o cumple con las regulaciones fitosanitarias que han entrado. En el caso de plantas para plantar o de materiales vegetales para la siembra o propagación, muchas veces estos materiales son sujetos de eh, cuarentena posentrada. Para ello, pues también hay unos criterios específicos y hay algunas que pueden apoyar para poder tener un mejor entendimiento de cómo funciona todo este proceso y cuáles son las reglas que se deben seguir para ello. Eh, ahora me voy a referir directamente a los trabajos que se hace desde la CIPF sobre Fusarium TR4. El Comité de Implementación y Desarrollo de la Capacidad creó un equipo específico para los temas que tienen que ver con Fusarium TR4. Este equipo tiene unas eh, o ha priorizado unas actividades que ustedes pueden ver aquí en pantalla, como está eh, hacer una revisión de eh, recursos contribuidos, la cual está disponible en la página web de la IPPC, junto con otros recursos contribuidos en varias materias. Eh, los invitamos también a que puedan consultar esta cantidad de recursos que están disponibles en la página web del IPPC y que a su vez también refieren eh, páginas como la de la Red Global TR4 del Foro Mundial Bananero. También el grupo está encargado de desarrollar un documento sobre prevención, preparación y respuesta para fusar un TR4, del cual les hablaremos posteriormente. También ha priorizado evaluar las capacidades de los países en materia de respuesta a fusar un TR4 y también eh, apoyar la realización de talleres virtuales sobre eh, diagnóstico vigilancia, de, eh, inspección y ejercicios de simulación. En este punto me voy a detener brevemente en lo que es la guía de prevención, preparación y respuesta para informarles que a este momento el grupo, el eh, equipo de Fusarium TR4 de la CIPF ha desarrollado un primer borrador de este documento. Este documento en este momento es sujeto de una revisión por pares eh, porque la intención es poder hacer lo más completo y mejor posible este documento. Se han invitado eh, una serie de expertos, eh, tanto científicos como de las UNPFs y de la academia, para actuar como eh, pares revisores. Hemos ten tenido una gran respuesta por parte de las personas que contactamos y contamos con 49 revisores que participarán en este proceso, más los miembros del Comité de Implementación y Desarrollo de la Capacidad que regularmente participan en la revisión de estos materiales. Aquí pueden ver de manera general eh, cuál es el contenido o cuál será el contenido de estas guías. Sin embargo, en este punto quiero invitarlos. La revisión estará abierta o está abierta desde el 11 de mayo hasta el 3 de junio. Eh, si bien ya contamos con 49 expertos, no está de más poder hacer más rica esta revisión. Así que si ustedes eh, quieren participar o conocen a alguien que podrían sugerir para actuar como revisor de estas guías, Voy a dejar mi correo electrónico en el chat para que por favor me contacten y les podamos incluir en, el, en la lista de revisores, teniendo en cuenta que la revisión ya empezó y que esperamos terminarla el 3 de junio. Sin embargo, creo que todavía estamos a tiempo para involucrar nuevos revisores y hacer este documento lo más completo posible. 
Eh, ahora me voy a referir a la serie de talleres sobre diagnóstico, vigilancia, inspección y ejercicios de simulación. En meses pasados tuvimos la oportunidad de talleres virtuales en los cuales contamos con una nutrida asistencia por parte de eh, los países alrededor del mundo. Contamos con excelentes ponentes. Este momento es solamente para invitarlos a que si ustedes quieren consultar acerca de alguno de estos temas, en la presentación dejamos el enlace para que puedan visitar eh, la grabación de las eh, presentaciones realizadas o las presentaciones también están allí disponibles y también tenemos unos documentos de preguntas y respuestas que compilan y resumen algunas de las eh, respuestas proporcionadas por los panelistas expertos que invitamos en su momento. Eh, esta última diapositiva está referida a la evaluación de las capacidades de los países para responder a Fusarium TR4. Eh, es una información preliminar y parcial eh, para mostrarles y llamar de pronto un poco la atención sobre cómo está en este momento eh, la respuesta de 20 países y lo que podemos encontrar sobre algunas cosas que pueden resultar importantes y vitales para prevenir la dispersión de Fusarium TR4T indistintamente de la vida. Tenemos que solamente 47% de los países que responden cuentan con un análisis de riesgo de plagas. Y ya anteriormente pudimos ver lo importante que es esta herramienta para poder eh, hacer, eh, tomar medidas fitosanitarias apropiadas para eh, prevenir la dispersión. 76% consideran que es una plaga reglamentada, sin embargo esto ya es una cuestión de percepción eh, nacional de cada país de acuerdo al nivel de protección adecuado que quieren proporcionar. Y también vemos que en términos de respuesta, no todos los países tienen un plan de vigilancia y no tienen un plan de contingencia. Entonces, esto es una oportunidad para que a través de estos foros, del Foro Mundial Bananero, de la CIPF, de la FAO, eh, se puedan de pronto enfocar y, eh, las baterías para poder atender este tipo de necesidades y poder hacer que todos lleguen a un consenso eh, o a una armonía en el nivel de implementación de prevención y respuesta. Mm. Como siempre, todos los documentos y, e información está disponible en la página web de la CIPF. Nuevamente le invitamos a visitarla. Gracias por su atención. Esto es todo por nuestra parte. Estimado don Camilo Bertrán, muchísimas gracias por la presentación y muchísimas gracias Sara eh, Brunel por la excelente presentación de todos los trabajos que están haciendo. Hemos visto... Hay bastantes preguntas en el chat, casi todas referidas a cómo ayudarles en la revisión de esos documentos. Entonces, sería muy interesante si pudieran poner los enlaces. Y, y gracias también por abrir la oportunidad para que otros colegas puedan también intervenir y dar sus aportes, porque eso es importante. Yo, por mi parte, intentaré hacer lo propio lo antes posible. Muy bien. Eh, estoy viendo en el, la sesión de preguntas y respuestas que han sido respondidas directamente. Yo creo que... Teniendo en cuenta el tiempo, podemos continuar. Así que eh, voy a pasar al español ahora porque las dos eh, panelistas que, que tenemos a continuación son las dos eh, eh, de la región y hablan español. Entonces quería eh, presentar ahora a la licenciada Nancy Villegas. Ella es bióloga y coordina la Oficina Regional de Análisis de Riesgos de Loirsa. Anteriormente eh, trabajó en la Dirección General de Sanidad Vegetal, Sen Senasica, primero como coordinadora del Departamento de Entomología y Acrología en el periodo 2001 a 2005. En el 2005 fue invitada a montar el primer programa de vigilancia epidemiológica fitosanitaria, donde coordinó el área de importación. Allá en el 2007 fue invitada por el doctor Javier Trujillo para coordinar el Departamento de Análisis de Riesgo de Plagas, donde trabajó hasta el 2017. Sin más dilación, me gustaría darle la palabra o la pantalla, mejor dicho, a, a la señora Villegas, eh, licenciada. Adelante, la pantalla es suya. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Víctor. Muchas gracias, Matius. Saludos a todos. Muchas gracias por la invitación a este evento. Si me permiten, voy a compartir la, la pantalla. O bien, si ustedes me hacen favor de, de apoyarme con la paso de las diapositivas. Ya puede compartir si quiere. Ya dejamos Muchas de compartir gracias. nosotros. Gracias, Nancy. Bienvenida. Me indican, por favor, si ven la presentación. Todavía no, seguramente está cargando. Aún no. A ver, déjame ver cuál es el problema. 
Permítame un momentito pequeño. Sin problema. Ahora está cargando. Ya podemos verla. No se, ve, no se ve a pantalla completa, pero si quiere puede ponerlo ahora sí. La Listo. pantalla es suya. Gracias. Nancy. Muchas gracias, Víctor. Bueno, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos. Un gusto saludarlos desde esta Coordinación Regional de Análisis de Riesgo. Les vamos a platicar un poquito sobre un procedimiento eh, que realizamos eh, todo el año 2020, en el año de la pandemia por COVID-19 y que fue publicado felizmente en el mes de marzo del 2021. Y este se refiere a las medidas de bioseguridad para la introducción y movimiento de material de propagación de musáceas en la región de Loírsa, recordando que Loírsa comprende nueve países, desde México, todos los países centroamericanos y República Dominicana en el Caribe. Bueno, este documento eh, fue elaborado con apoyo de la FAO y eh, comprende todo lo que es eh, un bosquejo general de lo que son los programas de innovación agrícola para la introducción con medidas de bioseguridad de material eh, promovido como, como resistente o tolerante al ataque de fusarium en, en el mundo. De manera que este documento cuenta con un sustento en análisis de riesgo y en él se han determinado las plagas que pueden ser observadas para la región de Loírsa, de manera que eh, se determine que, cuáles son las condiciones en las cuales deben de ser manejados estos materiales para ser importados en forma segura. Los objetivos del documento eh, son describir los niveles de riesgo de acuerdo a las fuentes de germoplasma, es aquellos países con presencia de la enfermedad o bien donde la enfermedad está ausente, pero que pueden eh, conllevar el movimiento de algunos otros riesgos traducidos como plagas asintomáticas o con bajos niveles de titulación en estos materiales. También eh, nos permite describir las actividades regulatorias previas a la introducción de germoplasma, esto enfocado principalmente a los países de la región de Loírsa, así como enunciar los requisitos que deben cumplir las instalaciones para el confinamiento y aislamiento de los materiales importados. Y finalmente nos apoya en la descripción de los procedimientos para la contención y manipulación de germoplasma desde su llegada a un país de la región hasta su diagnóstico definitivo y liberación a condiciones de campo. Como bien sabemos, eh, Musa es una planta o, o comprende a un grupo de plantas que son altamente susceptibles al ataque de una gran cantidad de plagas. Aquí nada más ponemos un pequeño enunciado de todas aquellas plagas que tienen en el banano y en el plátano un hospedero preferencial. De manera que en el ámbito internacional, este, este grupo de, de plantas comprendidas dentro del grupo de musa, pues puede ser ampliamente atacado por una gran cantidad de plagas. Se ha documentado alrededor de 500 en el ámbito internacional. Previo análisis de riesgo que sustenta la elaboración de, de este documento que promovemos en apoyo del sector y también con apoyo de nuestros amigos en la FAO, pues identificamos 15 plagas que pueden ser susceptibles a la observación en la importación de materiales, recalcando que estas no están acotadas únicamente a estas plagas, sino que pueden abarcar otras más que, que pueden representar un riesgo. Como ya comentó el compañero Camilo, hay plagas que son de índole cuarentenario, y cuando hablamos de plagas cuarentenarias nos referimos a aquellas que son consideradas en algún instrumento regulatorio por parte de alguno de nuestros países. De manera que abarca tanto plagas que son ausentes como plagas que están presentes con distribución restringida bajo control oficial y que ameritan la aplicación de medidas fitosanitarias para su movilización, contención, manejo, etcétera. Dentro de las plagas que son consideradas en este documento publicado por el OIRSE en conjunto con la FAO, pues tenemos varias especies de virus, varias especies de bacterias, varias especies de hongos y algunos otros organismos considerados 
como fitoplasmas que también pueden estar eh, presentes en materiales contaminados. Hay también plagas que están presentes dentro de algunos de los países de la región de Loírsa y que se consideran también como carácter eh, naturalizado, emergente o reemergente, esto en función de las condiciones ambientales que pueden ocasionar la aparición de eh, problemas fitosanitarios que ameriten manejo en algunos de los países de la región. También hay que llamar la atención que el movimiento de materiales que se mueven, materiales genéticos, producto de, de cultivo confinado, condiciones en vitro, eh, diferentes países han informado que se han detectado nuevos patógenos nuevos para la ciencia y que incluso estos patógenos puede ser que no hayan sido detectados previamente en algún proceso de análisis de riesgo y que amerite que sean observados por parte de las autoridades competentes de los países importadores de materiales genéticos. Hay un peligro latente de que estos eh, patógenos pueden ocurrir, ya sea que no se hayan descrito anteriormente en una asociación planta-parásito, en el caso de, de plantas de banano y de, y de plátano, y pues nosotros debemos de tener la observación de que esto puede ocurrir y que estos patógenos deben de ser tratados con todo el nivel de riesgo que amerita. En el caso de los países que conforman la región de Loírsa, pues contamos con un análisis de riesgo regional, algunos de nuestros países cuentan con un análisis de riesgo nacional y la recomendación desde esta parte regional como análisis de riesgo es que los países previo a la importación de materiales genéticos tolerantes o resistentes a raza 4 tropical de Fusarium, a la marchitez de las, de las musáceas, previamente realicen sus análisis de riesgo para identificar caso por caso a qué riesgos se están enfrentando como país. Ya hemos visto que hay una gran cantidad de patógenos que pueden estar asociados a la movilización de materiales y hay patógenos nuevos que se están descubriendo por parte de diferentes sectores científicos que pueden también poner en peligro la producción nacional de banano de alguno de los países de la región. Por ende, eh, es importante que se haga una caracterización precisa de acuerdo al nivel de protección de cada país. Hemos visto la importancia de que todos estos procesos de importación, de movilización, de regulación estén sustentados en un análisis de riesgo nacional. Eh, también es importante que cuando se hayan identificado las medidas fitosanitarias que conllevan la movilización de este germoplasma, pues se haga un reconocimiento de las entidades, de las empresas, de los laboratorios que realizan la producción de estos materiales, de manera que cuenten con la aprobación tanto del país, de la autoridad fitosanitaria del país eh, exportador, como de la autoridad fitosanitaria del país importador. Es recomendable también que previo a la movilización transfronteriza de estos materiales se haga una visita de reconocimiento de toda el área de producción de, de los mismos, de manera que se determinen las condiciones de bioseguridad en las cuales están producidos estos materiales y que permitan manejar adecuadamente el riesgo de una movilización de, de este tipo de, 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 de material que conlleva siempre ciertos riesgos de manera que todo el germoplasma que se mueva a un país eh, debe de pasar por un proceso de observación. Se recomienda que transite por un periodo de cuarentena que puede ser cumplida fuera del país en, en instalaciones reconocidas por las diferentes autoridades fitosanitarias o dentro del país en condiciones confinadas, preferentemente fuera de las áreas de influencia de producción bananera a nivel comercial. También se recomienda que las instalaciones de cuarentena sean reconocidas oficialmente por las autoridades del país y que éstas sean testeadas, sean, sean este, inspeccionadas en forma periódica, así como los materiales que se resguarden durante todo el tiempo que tengan que estar confinados ahí para determinar realmente cuál es el nivel de sanidad de esas plantas. 
De esta manera podemos asegurar que realmente se esté movilizando material limpio, material que va a cumplir con las expectativas a lo cual ha sido determinada su introducción y pues todo esto va a ayudar a fortalecer los aspectos legales y de comunicación entre diferentes socios comerciales a nivel internacional. Es muy importante darle seguimiento a estos materiales y una vez que se ha garantizado que realmente cumplen con las condiciones fitosanitarias de sanidad y bioseguridad, pues se puedan liberar al campo en una forma segura. Es muy importante que las instalaciones donde se vayan a realizar confinamiento de materiales importados para su posterior evaluación y comportamiento en un territorio nuevo, cuenten con toda la aplicación de requisitos en cuanto a cumplimiento de medidas de bioseguridad, de manera que se garantice realmente que ante cualquier contingencia se pueda tener una respuesta oportuna. De esta manera, desde la región de Loirsa promovemos la adopción de diferentes protocolos que garanticen el confinamiento de los materiales y la seguridad de los mismos, de manera que se cumplan estas condiciones para las cuales han sido promovida la importación, movilización o eh, transporte de materiales promisorios para el manejo de enfermedades cuarentenarias, como es el caso del fusario. De esta manera, eh, en la región de Loirsa sabemos que ha habido esfuerzos importantes para la producción de plantas sanas de cítricos, de cacao, de aguacate. Hay pocos ejemplos en el caso de plantas de musácea, sin embargo, desde la coordinación de la Dirección Regional de Sanidad Vegetal en el OIRSA, pues estamos promoviendo que se realice todo este proceso de evaluación de materiales promisorios en una forma eficiente y que no proceda como actos de buena fe. De manera que ante cualquier situación, una autoridad fitosanitaria nacional cuente con los elementos para poder eh, responder en forma eficiente ante cualquier situación que ocasione un proceso de contingencia. Y bueno, finalmente esta diapositiva enuncia en forma muy resumida cuáles son los procedimientos recomendados para resguardar la condición fitosanitaria de un país o de una región, de manera que estos sean cumplidos a cabalidad y que aseguremos que la movilización de materiales que se pretendan hacer se realicen en una forma segura, adecuada, con conocimiento de la autoridad y con seguridad para todas las partes. Les agradezco mucho su atención. Cualquier duda o comentario, estamos a sus apreciables órdenes. Muchas gracias a eh, toda la organización del Foro Mundial Bananero, a Víctor, a Matthews, y pues muchas gracias por su atención. Licenciada, muchísimas gracias, muy amable. Ha sido una presentación muy interesante y, eh, como siempre, eh, llena de información que nos interesa a todos. Vamos a pasar sin más dilación al siguiente, a la siguiente panelista eh, y veremos si hay espacio para una sesión de preguntas y respuestas al final de esta sección. Es un placer para mí presentar ahora a la licenciada Mónica Betancur Vázquez, habitual en nuestros eh, webinarios como Raísa, como Camilo, como eh, la señora Villegas, etc. Eh, ella es investigadora en Agrosavia, como saben, con experiencia en la, en la identificación, caracterización morf morfológica biológica y molecular de patógenos de plantas tales como hongos, omicetos, bacterias, fitoplasmas y virus. Tiene experiencia en análisis epidemiológico de enfermedades de plantas y desarrollo de estrategias con énfasis en control biológico y experiencia en procesos de producción in vitro e indexación de materiales de siembra y en el manejo agronómico y sanitario de frutales en climas fríos y cálidos. Actualmente lidera proyectos de, en prevención y manejo del marchitamiento de Fusarium de Musa en el país. Así que, doctora, licenciada, adelante, la pantalla es suya. Hola, buenos días y buenas bueno. tardes y noches a todos. Eh, pues primero que todo agradecer eh, la invitación eh, del Foro Mundial Bananero, de FAO y de todos los compañeros pues, que nos abren estos espacios para presentar pues nuestros avances en este proceso de importación de materiales. Por favor, ¿podemos continuar con la siguiente diapositiva? O bueno, o me das paso para que yo lo pueda hacer. Gracias. Mucho mejor. Me dicen si lo están viendo, por favor. 
Sí, vemos perfectamente. Perfecto. Entonces, bueno, eh, como les decía en esta pequeña introducción, la idea es contarles un poco cómo ha sido el proceso en Colombia para la introducción segura de los materiales que consideramos, consideramos promisorios por la resistencia a Fogger 4 t y un poco qué estamos haciendo desde la parte de evaluación. Voy a hacer una breve introducción de lo que significa FOG-R4T en Colombia y por qué entonces rápidamente nos pusimos en la tarea de introducir materiales. Después hablaré un poco de cómo llegamos a identificar cuáles eran esos materiales que estaban, digamos, que disponibles y cómo acceder a ellos. Y finalmente, los procesos que hemos diseñado para la importación de los materiales y los avances en el mismo. Pues básicamente, y es un poco una, una, un concepto que hemos venido manejando cada que hablamos de este tema, pero... Cuando en el 2019 se da el primer reporte en Colombia de lo que estaba pasando, de que teníamos FOB R4T, pues definitivamente Colombia tuvo que pasar de la teoría a la acción. Y rápidamente tuvo que empezar a hacer acciones pues, muy fuertes en contención, pero también muy fuertes en procesos de eh, investigación y articulación de todas las entidades. Eh, ¿Por qué? Porque básicamente teníamos que proteger pues, toda una industria bananera, que es bien importante para el país porque es el cuarto producto de exportación a nivel nacional. Hoy tenemos una situación de dos departamentos que tienen infe infección o que tienen focos. El foco en Magdalena un poco más reciente, solamente con dos fincas afectadas y mucho más contenida, pero unos focos un poco más grandes en las 11 fincas cuarentenadas de la, de la Guajira. Pero aún así también tenemos un riesgo gigante en relación a lo que puede ser esta enfermedad en los plátanos y los bananos que se siembran en los 32 departamentos del país, es decir, los plátanos y bananos que no son de exportación, que representan un riesgo para la producción. Entonces, rápidamente tuvimos que empezar a mirar qué teníamos disponible, qué se podía hacer, aparte de todas las otras acciones que ya estaba haciendo el ICA y que Agrosavia empezó a apoyar desde la parte de investigación. Identificamos que había posibilidades de introducir materiales que provenían del Instituto de Investigaciones de Taiwán, que podía haber materiales de raja en Meristen, que podía haber materiales provenientes de la Universidad de Queensland, que podía haber materiales de eh, CIRAC, de Embrapa, de FIA, y empezamos a trabajar con ellos lo que llamamos acuerdos de transferencia, es decir, unos documentos que nos permiten revisar cómo entrar los materiales seguros al país y qué pruebas de investigación se pueden hacer con ellos. Rápidamente logramos acuerdos en ese momento con CIRAC y con Embrapa, CIRAT con un objetivo muy específico de evaluar unos materiales que ya tenían pruebas de evaluación previas en Australia, ahorita más tarde les, les comento cuáles, y un material que es una selección de Cavendish Ruby que tenía también buen comportamiento o tolerancia. Encontramos también que los materiales de Embrapa, como les comentó ya el doctor Exxon en su exposición, pues tenían una oportunidad gigante para el país, dado que Embrapa lleva muchísimos años de investigación Nunca abandonó la investigación de Infoc R1 y por lo tanto eran promisorios para lo que queríamos hacer y aquí se unieron los esfuerzos de las asociaciones, en este caso Augura, para fortalecer un programa de premejoramiento en el país. En el caso de Rahan se llegaron a acuerdos específicos con el ICA para poder entregar o entrar de manera segura el material y entonces se arrancó con el proceso pues, de introducción. Ese proceso de introducción nos obligó en primer momento a identificar cuáles eran los riesgos y me sirve muchísimo la presentación que acaba de hacer la doctora Nancy porque en parte fue, eh, fue digamos que aportes de lo que fue esa primera discusión de cuáles eran los riesgos. Entonces, el primer riesgo que analizamos es el tipo de material que vamos a traer, qué riesgo trae, como en todos los países afortunadamente y específicamente en Colombia, hace mucho tiempo tenemos normas que impiden la entrada de material que no sea in vitro, pues al contar con material que es de tipo in vitro, que viene en frascos de vidrio, en frascos de plástico, pues estamos eliminando todo el riesgo de problemas como hongos y bacterias e incluso pues nematodos si fuéramos a tenerlos en cuenta. Esto no es así si usamos o si empezamos a hacer procesos de importación de materiales que traigan cualquier tipo de sustrato. Entonces, como ya teníamos eliminado ese riesgo, pues no solamente nos quedaba pensar en cuáles otros problemas o patógenos podían llegar a través del material, y efectivamente, como lo mencionó también la doctora Nancy, en el caso de virus, pues existen numerosos reportes de la posibilidad de introducción de virus, específicamente del virus del cogollo ranicimoso o el bonchitoc, y de incluso virus del gallado del benbanano, porque cuando no se conocen bien o no se hacen unos procesos de producción del material in vitro, que impliquen el uso de procedimientos como la quimioterapia y la termoterapia, pero que además impliquen utilizar meristemos muy pequeños, 
el riesgo de utilizar meristemos grandes que tengan concentraciones de virus que pueden desarrollarse es muy alto y de hecho eso está descrito pues para varios virus y específicamente en musáceas cuando se tienen procesos de diagnóstico difíciles pues entonces puede fácilmente entrar material contaminado con virus incluso en material in vitro. Entonces ese riesgo estaba latente, revisamos entonces cuáles eran los riesgos específicos para Colombia, en Colombia tenemos cuatro virus reportados pero tres de esos virus que aparecen como importantes dentro de las musáceas no están en el país, virus del cogollo racimoso de la vaca, virus del mosaico de la vaca y virus, por supuesto, el bonchito. Y para nosotros la alerta más grande estaba en estos dos, en el virus del rayado del banano, porque además es un virus que tiene diferentes variantes, o realmente son varios virus diferentes que a veces no son fáciles de diagnosticar y que no tenemos muchas de esas cepas en el país. Y el, por supuesto el bonchito que se considera un virus altamente agresivo y con un potencial muy fuerte de dispersión. Yo no puedo dejar de presentar esta diapositiva cada que estoy en estos escenarios porque creo que después de Fog R4T la, la mayor amenaza que tiene el sector es la llegada de bonchito. Monchito genera unos síntomas muy fuertes, destruye completamente la producción de la planta. No está en nuestra zona, o sea que esta misma grafiquita que nos presentaban para FOG R4T ahora la tenemos que poner para Monchito. Hay que hacer todo lo posible por excluir este patógeno porque además en toda la zona tenemos el vector de esta enfermedad que es pentalonia nervosa. Y una vez tengamos casos positivos, pues el proceso de contención va a ser mucho más complejo incluso que FOG R4T. Entonces, ya sabíamos que el material solo nos presentaba riesgos por, el, por virus. Analizamos entonces las procedencias de los materiales que queríamos traer. Teníamos cuatro procedencias, Israel, Brasil, Francia y Honduras. Se me olvidó comentar que Honduras también tenemos un acuerdo con DOL para entrar unos materiales de 218. Analizamos entonces qué materiales, qué, perdón, qué patógenos estaban presentes en Colombia y cuáles no respecto a los países procedentes. En algunos casos pues no se tiene información sobre esos virus en esas zonas del mundo, pero sí sabíamos entonces, empezamos a, de, a definir que los riesgos para Colombia definitivamente eran bonchitov, el virus de la vaca, como les dije, el virus de la vaca bonchitov y el virus X, pues que no estaban descritos en el país, eh, pero además sabíamos que aunque estos lugares de procedencia no nos daban alerta frente a esa posibilidad de entrar la enfermedad, como algunos de los materiales, sobre todo de Israel, tenían un camino, es decir, venían desde Filipinas, pues nuestro riesgo era muy alto que pudieran entrar algunos de los virus. Ampliamos nuestro perfil de riesgos también a tener en cuenta FOC que ya estaba en el país y que teníamos que garantizar que cualquier material que se produjera en condiciones de cuarentena no fuera a estar infectado con esta enfermedad. Y también Rastonia, que es un problema pues, bien importante también para el país, que no queríamos que hubiese ningún riesgo de dispersión a través del material que se estuviera generando en cuarentena. Entonces, se generó todo el protocolo de cuarentena posentrada, como les explicó un poco Nancy, es un protocolo que cuenta con diferentes procesos al interior o procedimientos que regulan básicamente toda la entrada y salida de, de los materiales o de las cosas que hacen en cuarentena y que aumenta la bioseguridad a un nivel tal que impide pues, la entrada de cualquier patógeno al país, sea porque llegó en las plantas o sea porque se infectó dentro del sitio de trabajo o el sitio de cuarentena. Mm. Desarrollamos con el ICA toda una plataforma de diagnóstico con 10 patógenos, esos 10 patógenos orientados principalmente a virus, pero como les dije también quisimos ampliar o maxificar nuestro riesgo y tener en cuenta en este caso de Fusarium y Rastonia para evitar cualquier eh, pues, tipo de, de problema en la cuarentena. En este momento nosotros ingresamos el material de CIDAD el 25 de agosto del 2021 Entraron estos cuatro materiales, Rubí, CIRAD 924, CIRAD 931 y 938. El ICA tomó muestras para los análisis fitosanitarios y la aplicación de esta plataforma el 27 de febrero y el 28 de febrero repitió, es un segundo muestreo y afortunadamente todo salió súper bien. No tenemos ningún problema en nuestras plantas, los patógenos fueron todos negativos en, los, en las pruebas que se hicieron, incluso en las de virus del rayado del banano que fueron hechas por ANSES en Francia y en este momento justamente hoy las plantas están saliendo para las diferentes zonas donde van a ser evaluadas. En el caso de Embrapa, el material entró, entraron 18 materiales, entraron a principios de año y en este momento pues están en desarrollo vegetativo, son materiales que en este momento tenemos en la custodia de agrosavia para su manejo. Eh, después de la cuarentena, los materiales van a pruebas de evaluación de resistencia en condiciones de vivero y campo, condiciones controladas que tenemos en una finca afectada, pero también vamos a tener pruebas de adaptación de estos materiales 
en el caso eh, de Magdalena y en el caso de Urabá con semibanano, esto se aplicará a los materiales de cirat y a los materiales de embrapa. En el caso de los materiales de Rajan, el ICA sigue en la definición de los procesos de investigación que seguirán allí por un proceso de eh, pues, eh, las propiedades intelectuales asociadas. Yo quiero terminar mi presentación con un pequeño video. Ustedes en la presentación van a encontrarlo. Por favor, me dicen si lo están viendo. Temo, eh, licenciada, que tenemos problemas con la reproducción del vídeo, además de, de que son siete minutos, casi ocho. Oh, no, no se escucha. Solo quería, no se escucha. Sí. Ok, perfecto. Pero, Entonces, déjame, sí, es súper interesante. Déjame terminar, uh -huh. eh, eh, Víctor. Sí, pero déjame, déjame que le indique. Nosotros eh, siempre, eh, tanto la información como el PowerPoint, como el vídeo de esta reunión, como materiales complementarios los ponemos en la página web. Entonces, eh, lo puede poner aquí en el chat y también lo pondremos en la página web nuestra para que puedan verlo los participantes. Adelante, compañera. Perfecto, me disculpan que no se vea. Básicamente, les, les dejo allí en el... En el... En la presentación dos videos, en un video está toda la parte de los protocolos y cómo se han implementado y la parte de eh, cómo, se, cómo está funcionando la cuarentena es el segundo video que era el que les quería mostrar porque puede ser más visual para ustedes ver cómo es el funcionamiento. Termino básicamente con unas conclusiones, el riesgo más grande para el sector bananero después de que tengamos o pensemos en que se disperse Fogue Recuarote es la entrada de Bonchitop y tenemos que prepararnos para eso, pero además tenemos que evitarlo a toda costa y el riesgo de introducción de materiales, lo dijo Raiza, lo dijo Nancy, nos lleva a, este, a esta posibilidad que podamos ingresar Bonchitop si no se tienen las, pues digamos que todos los, los controles adecuados eh, y básicamente necesitamos que los países blinden sus fronteras para que esto no pase y pues no afectemos al sector. Agradecimientos a, al equipo de trabajo, por ahí veo al doctor Jaime Cárdenas, al doctor Huarte de Turizo, esta información se generó con ellos, fueron el alma de, de este proceso inicial a quien siempre les agradeceré y por supuesto un equipo de trabajo grandísimo que también acompaña desde Agrosavia, así como las entidades aliadas CIRAT y Embrapa. Muchísimas gracias, yo con eso termino, Víctor. Muchísimas gracias, licenciada Betancourt. Y gracias a todos los panelistas de esta sección. Ha sido muy interesante y estamos muy contentos de tenerles con nosotros, como es habitual, presentando información tan eh, interesante. Como siempre nos ocurre, estamos un poco limitados en el tiempo. Creo que es importante que eh, por lo menos cubramos la agenda y después, cuando terminemos, quizás podemos hacer una breve eh, sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Hay algunas preguntas como... Eh, ¿Cómo creen que estamos en, en la región para la importación de material vegetal, eh, de forma segura, situación en Venezuela? ¿Cómo estamos con respecto a la movilización de recursos? Pero son preguntas que quizás podemos eh, discutir una vez que terminamos con la agenda y debido a muchos temas, por ejemplo, interpretación, tiempo de los participantes, etc. Entonces, de nuevo, licenciada Betancourt, muchísimas gracias por la excelente información. Pasamos ahora al, eh, al doctor Jeff Daniels. Paso interpretación al inglés, eh, porque esto va a ser en inglés. The Dr. Jeff Daniels has been working uh, with bananas for the last 37 years uh, as a research uh, horticulturalist with the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries based in South Johnston. He has remarkable experience in the field of bananas and currently works on a number of important industry projects looking at disease resistance and agroeconomics of agronomics, sorry, not agroeconomics, agronomics of alternative varieties particularly those varieties which have some tolerance to Fusarium TR4. So, um, Mateus, please launch the uh, presentation of Dr. Daniels. Hello, everyone. I'll cover a little background first to set the scene. Australian banana producing areas are shown in red shading. 
I'm based at South Johnston on the wet tropical coast of North Queensland, the Blue Arrow. Well over 90% of Australian production is located in this region. Annually, there are about 370,000 tonnes produced from about 14,000 hectares. TR4 was first detected in Australia in 1997 in the Northern Territory, see the X on the map, but it wasn't until 2015 that it occurred in the major production area in North Queensland. In the seven years since then, it's been contained to just five farms in the Tully Valley and only about 160 infected plants have been detected. This is a relatively slow rate of spread and it's testament to the massive biosecurity effort put in by all concerned. Cavendish is the main type of banana grown, accounting for about 95% of Australian production. The Williams cultivar accounts for most of that. A few other types of banana are grown, with ladyfinger the most important, but it only represents about 4% of Australian banana production overall. Both types are very susceptible to Panama disease, tropical race four. So where did we obtain new varieties in our quest for a commercial variety with TR4 resistance? I've been researching varieties long before TR4 came along. So we had contacts and relationships in place to facilitate access. However, funding cuts to some overseas programs had begun to limit that access. Following the TR4 incursion in North Queensland, we prepared an options paper. This extracted the wealth of information stored away in brain cells over the years, helping to describe the different banana plant improvement programs, mostly overseas, identifying and justifying where to put our attention. Cavendish selections were of course a priority, but ladyfinger style and novel hybrids were also needed, particularly for the subtropical industry. To augment supply of the TR4 resistant Cavendish selections, we sought to generate variants ourselves via mutagenesis in Australia based on previous success against subtropical race four in the 1990s. Reviewing the situation to begin with in this manner was very valuable and should not be overlooked. Perhaps you already have TR4 in your production area and there is urgency to get resistant varieties to herding producers. Nevertheless, a quarantining stage should remain an important step because you don't want to create more problems than you already have by inadvertently bringing in exotic pests and diseases during the variety introduction phase. This is the quarantine facility in Brisbane where banana plants from overseas are screened into Australia. After importation, quarantine and in vitro multiplication stages, we commence an agronomic assessment where I am stationed at South Johnston. Concurrently, a TR4 field screening commences in collaboration with the Northern Territory Government which Charles will report upon in the next talk. As a biosecurity measure, TR4 field and greenhouse trials are only permitted in the Northern Territory. This is to greatly lessen the proliferation of disease inoculum in Queensland. These sets of trials are usually for a plant and return crop. When you import a variety, it needs to go through a testing phase in your production situations to see how it responds to your environments climate and edaphic factors, and your crop management procedures, which can be very different to where it has originated from. You need to verify that you've received what you thought you were getting. Make sure they're not tissue culture off types or a mix up with another variety. The same is true for their TR4 resistance status. Their disease reaction needs to be compared in the field with those reference varieties of known disease reaction. We have had cases where an imported variety was supposed to be resistant, but this was not the case in our field screening trials. Apart from morph types and mix ups, this could also be because unreliable information provided or poor transferability of the overseas results to our particular testing environment. This composite image shows some of the morphological characteristics that can be important in confirming the identity of a variety. Recently, we encountered this off type somatic variant, the image on the left and in the center. Most of the leaves have a portion of their lamina sorted, the blue arrows. The plants are slow to bunch and fruit are quite short. In our agronomic field trial, we had 28 plants of this variety, of which 26 were the off type. Only two were normal, true to type. 
In a TR4 screening trial, Charles will report on next. All 24 plants of that variety were off type. However, not all off types are deleterious. Be on the lookout for good ones too. Almost all the Cavendish selections demonstrated to have resistance to TR4 in the field in Australia have originated in Taiwan. Most have what I have termed intermediate resistance, a slowly susceptible reaction, if you like. Bunch photos of a few shown here. We have just completed a large agronomic comparison of varieties at South Johnston. These graphs show, I'll show just focus on those Cavendish selections with TR4 resistance. They are compared to Williams industry standard in red. This graph shows cumulative yield for the first two crops, which range from 63 to 92 percent of the yield of Williams. These yields were significantly less than Williams for all varieties. The same varieties showing average height for the first two crops. So many are taller than Williams, which can make crop management more difficult and often leads to greater losses to wind and so forth. In-house taste panelling also occurs during stage one to gauge if there are any likely problems on this front. In Australia, we have identified resistance in several hybrids from the FIA and Sierra breeding programs, as well as some cooking bananas, including the Sabah type banana, Pisangaji Mera. I don't have time here to go into detail about their agronomic and fruit organoleptic characteristics, except to say that they are much lower yielding than Williams Cavendish often much taller and will require considerable effort to build any sort of market. You can read more of my thoughts on this subject in the paper presented at the 2011 International Banana Symposium in Brazil. Stage two of field evaluations is where we take the best performing varieties from the initial agronomic and TR4 screening studies onto some selected growers' properties. The trials are intended to give an opportunity for production in a range of environments under commercial conditions. On-farm trials provide the opportunity for greater scale, as well as obtaining commercial producer insights and perspectives, including feedback from the market supply chain. Four on-farm trial sites were established in North Queensland and one in the Northern Territory with these two varieties, compared alongside the industry standard Williams. The sites have between 200 to 300 plants of each variety. A grower group had seen how healthy and TR4 disease free these selections were in the Northern Territory screening site. They were keen to see for themselves how they performed on some of their own properties. They produced nice bunches, but unfortunately for the growers, the productivity fell well short of Williams, grown in the absence of TR4. These selections also seem more prone to falling over due to strong winds and so forth. As I mentioned earlier, my department also embarked on its own banana mutagenesis program following the TR4 incursion in North Queensland. Four Cavendish selections with disease resistance were chosen as candidates, along with the Goldfinger, which is also resistant. We sought to improve the agronomic characteristics of the Cavendish selections and to improve the organoleptic characteristics of the Goldfinger, whilst retaining TR4 resistance. We have selected 18 variants from the Cavendish work, which are being multiplied for further testing. For Goldfinger, it was quite remarkable, the large extent of variation in morphological characteristics that were generated by mutagenesis. Here are six variants generated with very different bunch characteristics compared to Goldfinger in the top left. We also identified improvements in the organoleptic qualities of some variants. We have narrowed down these latter superior variants to five, which have recently undergone large-scale consumer taste battling, as well as sensory evaluation. Further confirmation of TR4 resistance is planned before commencement of on-farm trials. In Australia, we see resistant varieties as just part of the solution to dealing with TR4. People want a silver bullet, but experience so far in seeking a direct TR4 disease resistant replacement for Cavendish is such that selections suitable for the supply chain have at best only slowly susceptible intermediate type reactions. So they need to be part of an integrated production system to achieve sustainable outcomes. This is the case with former SANA in the Philippines. And there are typically yield and or fruit quality penalties associated with resistance to the disease meaning that their adoption will be greatly delayed. 
if the main competition in the marketplace is variety such as the susceptible Williams, grown in the absence of TR4. We did hear some very promising talks from the banana breeders at the January webinar organised by FAO WBF, but even if silver bullets do exist, which would be good for facilitating easier adoption of a solution to TR4, we shouldn't overlook other things that can make a positive difference. In particular, I'm thinking of strategies that reduce disease and oculum levels present. That can be more difficult to implement, but may nevertheless bring other spin-offs and advantages. For example, fallows might point to new crop opportunities or mitigate other pests and disease issues. There are a number of papers available on the subject of integrated approaches to deal with Panama disease, including this one, which was largely based on my presentation at the second international symposium on Fusarium wilted banana in Brazil in 2003. What if TR5 or something else comes along? The application of an integrated approach will find banana producers better placed to handle the new challenges that eventuate. All for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mateus. And yeah, excellent. Um, information provided by Dr. Jeff Daniels. Um, oh, without any uh, delays, because I'm mindful of the time, we're almost at, at the end of our meeting, so I, I will kindly request our interpreters to be with us uh, at least 10 minutes more, if that is possible. Um, I'd like to go ahead with the next panelist and last panelist, uh, Dr. Shal Mintov, a plant pathologist in the plant pathology laboratory in the Northern Territory uh, since 2016. He's involved in general plant pathology and diagnosis of plant samples. And he's been involved in research of Fusarium uh, Tropical Race 4, particularly uh, field trials and screening for TR4 resistant biotitis as part of a larger national research project. Before he, um, his previous work on TR4 also included uh, research ways to, or ways to, to manage inoculum levels in soil with cover crops, assessments of potential alternative witch hots, and harbor the pathogen and screening of mutant varieties for the resistance to TR4. So, uh, Mateus, please, uh, our second panelist um, from Australia, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Charles Mintoff. I'm a plant pathologist in the Department of Industry, Tourism and Trade in the Northern Territory of Australia. Um, so I'm going to use this presentation to go through uh, some of our field screening trials that we've been doing over the past few years, um, particularly screening for uh, resistance for to tropical race four in various banana varieties. So just a bit of a quick history of TR4 in Australia. Uh, it was actually first detected in June 1997 in Northern Territory. Um, in the Darwin region, we can, you can see up here where the star is. Um, so that actually triggered a biosecurity response and that property was uh, put under quarantine. Um, unfortunately, as years went by, more and more properties um, actually were detected to have the, the fungus and pretty much it, containment of the um, pathogen failed ultimately. And I think since 1997, um, you saw a pretty much a steep decline in, of the banana industry in Northern Territory. Um, to the point where in 2012, it was actually declared endemic in the NT. Um, as a result of that, I think Northern Territory is probably the only place in Australia where we can actually work with uh, TR4. Um, so particularly for the pot trials and the field trial stuff that we do. So for the more recent work that we've done is in collaboration with the Queensland government as part of a broader national program. And some of the stuff I'm going to go through today is uh, some three rounds of trials we've done since 2016 and probably ended probably January this year. So how we did it, um, this is probably just very brief, but uh, essentially with the replicated field trials, we had I think ultimately four replicate um, blocks in each field trial um, with each varieties in blocks of uh, six in each replicate. And the field trials contain the reference varieties, I think, which is probably the most important thing. Is this, so these reference varieties are of known 
um, susceptibility or resistance to TR4. So for the initial trials, uh, we had the Williams Cavendish, which is uh, which we deem as a very susceptible, and that's sort of important because that's our industry standard in Australia. Uh, for our intermediate, which is not quite resistant and not quite susceptible, is the GCTC uh, TCV218, which is former SANA. And that one's actually quite important because we know how well that does overseas and field trials in the Southeast Asia and in, I think more recently in Africa and how productive it can be with minimal losses in fields infested with TR4. So for us, that variety is sort of the acceptable level of um, minimum level of resistance that we want. So anything that matches or does better than Formasana is something we want to look at. And we've also got two uh, res resistant varieties, the FIA1, Goldfinger, and FIA25. I think FIA25 was used in the first uh, round of uh, trials that we did, but I think it was eventually cut in the uh, following ones. So assessments took place um, usually fortnightly and we looked at sort of external symptoms, internal symptoms, predominantly internal symptoms at harvest and at death. We took agronomic assessments and I think at the end of each uh, crop cycle we sort of tried to assign each variety a score and that score was sort of worked out by looking at the amount of plants that were diseased and were killed um, and how many plants were assessed. And that sort of gave us a score between zero and two. So zero essentially means no plants in that variety uh, show any signs of TR4 infection, whereas two pretty much showed that 100% of those plants were showed uh, disease symptoms and were killed by TR4. And we can sort of use that score to try and give them a broader uh, disease uh, resistance rating, um, which we've sort of defined here. Um, I realize I probably rushing through the methodology, but you can go through it more in the uh, paper that was recently published last year, which is down here. So for the first um, trial I'm gonna go through, this was sort of planted in 2016. Um, so I probably should point out that all our trials are artificially inoculated. So essentially at planting, each plant exposed to about 200 milliliters of TR4 infested billet. Um, and the plants pretty much sit on that and planting. So we expect the plants to be exposed to a very high inoculum. So for this particular trial, there were 24 varieties, including the references. Um, predominantly, it included Cavendish varieties, uh, parental lines using the FIA program, uh, FIA hybrids, and some uh, other sort of varieties we had on hand to test. It was assessed over two crop cycles and eventually ended in March, 2018. So what did that eventually look like? Um, basically, I've sort of colored this table to give you a bit more uh, clarity. Essentially, green is good, red is bad. Um, one of the things we sort of took away is how many of, about 50% sort of rated resistant or higher. And it was actually pretty good because um, some of the Taiwanese Cavendish lines resisted higher, rated uh, resistant or higher, which is good and to be expected. Um, we also found that CJ19, which is an Indonesian line, um, actually did pretty well against TR4 uh, in this trial. But also some fear lines, fear 2 particularly, and fear 18 uh, resistant, uh, was resistant or highly resistant. And fear 3 uh, in particular uh, was actually quite high, a bit higher than um, former SANA. But more encouragingly, for probably for the breeding programs, is the parental lines that have sort of we tested quite a lot of them actually did pretty well uh, against TR4. And just to give you a quick idea of what the varieties look like. So these are some of the more resistant Cavendish varieties that we found in that trial. So CJ19, GCT, CV215 and 247. Um, that's a picture of the plant crop, but I think the return crop was pretty much in a very similar fashion. Um, as you can see, I look very happy and healthy despite being exposed to TR4. So if we jump ahead to the end of 2018, um, we had we did another screening trial where we looked at 32 different varieties. Um, this particular trial had to be split into two different um, experimental designs uh, because I think we had issues with supply of some uh, sample of some um, tissue culture material. So we were split into the main trial, which was a full um, design that we used previously, and the sub trial, which was a smaller planting. 
I'm just going to focus on the main trial, which are the varieties uh, you can sort of see here. And we had more Cavendish varieties, but also additions from the CRAD program and some more hybrids and um, other sort of diversity in terms of uh, whether varieties we're testing. So this, again, this went for another uh, two crop cycles and it sort of ended in a sort of a bit after, towards the end of 2020. So to give you an idea of what we're looking at, just a reminder that uh, generally the disease scores, a score of zero means no disease symptoms were noted in any of the plants. Um, a score of two, essentially all diseased plants in a particular variety and all were killed by TR4. And we can sort of see some of the cereal lines straight away in the plant crop at least, there's no um, disease symptoms observed. And our gold finger, which is our resistance control, um, there were some initial uh, some initial signs of symptoms we sort of saw early on. And also with the Cavendish, the 217 and the 105, was still pretty low uh, disease uh, infection in those particular varieties compared to the former sana. And unfortunately, the rest of them were pretty close to that of what you see in the um, very acceptable uh, reference variety. Um, to give you a brief sort of overview of what that looks like in the field, um, to give you an example of CRAD 5, which didn't show anything in the plant crop. Uh, 215, uh, only a small amount of plants showed some internal symptoms, but ultimately that looked fine. And we got the more susceptible um, 215, uh, CJ19, and uh, NOF type, and the high noon. Interesting with the high noon is there was seemed to be some sort of recovery going on, because based on the previous uh, graph, it was sort of the worst performing variety. But when we go to the first return, miraculously, it sort of moved from the end of the graph to suddenly it's looking a bit better than former sana. So that's actually quite an interesting result. I'm sort of curious to know what went on there and how it recovered. But in the return crop, you can sort of see the CRADs are still doing pretty well. I think we did notice some internal symptoms in one of the CRAD fives. Um, dwarf pl uh, French plantain, the affected plant that we saw in the plant crop seemed to have recovered and it was actually fine. Uh, Goldfinger and the 105 and the 217s actually didn't really move much. It stayed and it retained its sort of normal resistance. But a bit weird that high noon actually sort of uh, seemed to have a decrease in um, disease severity, despite this having the same amount of plants assessed. So what that sort of means in terms of that particular trial is that uh, we had a, a few varieties there that actually performed better than former sana. Uh, the 105, the 217, the dwarf French plantain, and some of the CRAD lines actually did pretty well. Um, one of the things I want to point out is that even though we did have pretty, like um, some resistant lines, there are some agronomic issues that we sort of dealt with. I think either it's long cropping cycles, or I think an example I'm going to give is CRAD4. It showed no symptoms at all, but it was actually very prone to snapping just before harvest. Now, I don't know if that's actually a trait of the variety or it just in particular like the environment it was grown in in Northern Territory. Um, so I think from those lines, I think there needs to be sort of further work to see whether or not any of those particular lines are commercially viable in the Australian market. So if we sort of move ahead to the next trial, um, this is was only sort of run for one cropping cycle only. We had a bit of spare time after the following trial in our project. Um, we were hoping an extension, but it, that didn't quite come to fruition. So I've only got the plant crop results. So for this particular variety, we ran, um, assessed 23 varieties, including the three references. So um, we did have a couple of Cavendish. Uh, we did have some more uh, CRAD lines, but also had some additions from the Embrapa program. And we also screened some um, parental lines and some more diverse lines. But more interestingly, uh, some of these ones, these are Goldfinger mutant selections that were developed in Queensland. Um, essentially, that's part of a separate mutagenesis program that we're trying to work on, trying to improve the agronomics of resistant varieties. So that was sort of interesting to see how that turns out. And this trial sort of ended uh, in January this year. So how did that look? Um, so basically, not so much resistant lines to speak of to begin with. Um, interestingly enough, sorry, uh, some of the Goldfinger mutants actually did pretty well. So they sort of sat in the high-low resistance range. 
um, particularly these particular mutants. Uh, the other goldfinger mutant here is sort of similar to that of a normal goldfinger. So that's actually quite good. And I believe these ones sort of had improved agronomic qualities. Um, interesting enough, one of the CIRADs actually did pretty well and didn't show any symptoms and a couple of the parental lines. Um, one of the Embrapa lines that we have sort of okay, sort of similar to that of Formasana um, and sort of so the uh, Cavendish and some of the other parental and some of the CIRADs and other Embrapa lines sort of didn't do as well. But I just want to stress it's only the plant crop uh, results only. Ideally, would have the um, first return crop data to actually look at if it's more of a better idea of how they sit. So what's next? So basically from that, we actually know that several varieties did pretty well over the years when we tested it, particularly some of the Cavendish lines. Um, interestingly enough, quite a few parental lines did pretty well. So that resistance does uh, exist in some of the parental material that's actually used in the breeding programs and more particularly some of the uh, CIRAD lines and fear lines in particular actually show very strong resistance to TR4. But one of the things I sort of want to point out here is even though we've identified some lines that are resistant, that doesn't necessarily mean them great for the uh, market. Yeah, particularly in Australia or internationally. So at the moment it's a bit of a um, resistance versus market accept acceptability. Well, we in reality we need both. Um, so at the moment we're sort of looking at, uh, particularly in the Queensland group, looking at um, pre-commercialization trials where they're evaluating some of the resistant lines that we've identified in the Northern Territory and giving some as a research trial to some growers see how they go. Um, we're, we're waiting to see how that goes and what feedback we get from the growers, but hopefully we can actually get something useful out of that. Uh, so just some acknowledgements, um, just a big shout out to the Northern Territory team. Um, over the years, uh, pretty much we wouldn't have actually done anything without them and without their help and some of the Queensland colleagues. So thank you very much for listening. Um, hopefully didn't go through too quick. Perfect. Thank you very much. Highly appreciated. So special thanks now in this uh, last section to um, Dr. Charles Mintoff and Dr. Jeff Daniels. Highly appreciated. Voy a cerrar en español. Eh, casi todos nuestros participantes son de la región. De nuevo, muchísimas gracias a todos. Gracias a los panelistas, a los participantes por su tiempo, incluso los participantes de Australia y sobre todo Gracias a los colegas de interpretación. Nos hemos ido bastante en el tiempo, pero les agradezco mucho que hayan decidido quedarse con nosotros y darnos este apoyo hasta que terminemos de, de cerrar. Como es habitual, eh, pueden encontrar toda la información de este webinario y los anteriores que teníamos en diagnóstico, en, en variedades, etcétera, en la página web de la red global de R4T del Foro Mundial Bananero, en, en la página web de la FAO. Y eh, para terminar, gracias también al equipo de la FAO, tanto a las, eh, al, al IPPC, Raisa, Esther Peralta, los compañeros que trabajan en diferentes TCPs, además con de, eh, por supuesto, las oficinas nacionales y regionales fitosanitarias que nos dan apoyo en, en todo momento para continuar con las actividades. Así que sin más, darles las gracias y, y por favor estén atentos a nuestra página web porque continuaremos ofreciéndoles más apoyo, más información y más webinarios antes de que termine el año. Un saludo para ustedes y Mateus, no sé si quieres decir algo. Solo muchas gracias a todos por la participación y que accedan a los próximos eventos. Muchas gracias.